I'm about to marry a Miss Namibia <laughs> and I've got 900 bucks Jeez. in my account. Ooh. Am I effing mad? What answer did you get <laughs> with that question? I prayed, bro. I yeah. prayed right then and there. I prayed and I said, Lord, here we go. Here we go, me and you again. We're about to have another conversation. Mm. Gee, everyone will tell me, yo, bro, you're so great. You are so fantastic at what mm. you're doing. You are so talented. And at the same time, I had people say, we can't work with you because you're so talented and I'm not that talented. Ooh. So therefore, I need to wait till I'm on your level to work with you. I'm Jeez. like, this is the this is new. Mm. <laughs> like, this is new. So maybe you should dumb down your own skills. You know what <laughs> so I mean? So it matches others. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I thought to myself and I'm like, but I, I am not capable of doing that. Yeah. The uncomfortability with being in the entertainment industry right now is being real. Mm-hmm. Not adopting what the entertainment business wants you to be. It's being because now it's, it's, now it's a game of emulating what's out there. You know, looking like everyone else looks, mm-hmm. sounding like everyone else sounds, you know, wearing what everyone else wears because, you know, if you don't have that, you're not validated, you're not verified, you're mm-hmm. not blue tagged. She passed away. We had to go to the funeral that weekend. Mm-hmm. And literally a week after the car accident, I was back at work. And I never had a day off after that. I never took three months off. I never took a month off. I never had a week off to go rehabilitate myself. Mm. People ask me, so how did you heal? I was healing myself in front of people's eyes while I was on screen by myself. And the support of my family. As a young man moving, having to move to Joburg and having no family and sleeping on people's floors. And the only thing that I had to cover myself was the clothes that I had in my bag at that point in time. King King David Studio Podcast. All right, we have Clint uh, Brink today in the studio. The last time I I saw Clint, he was walking down a corridor at the SABC TV reception and he was singing. I remember thinking, hey, this guy's singing. He might just do a concert right there. <laughs> <laughs> he might just do a concert right there. At the time, I didn't know uh, uh, that he was a great singer. And uh, that tells you it's a long, long, long time ago. I hope you're well, my man. Brother, I am great. I am great. It's good to see you. Great is a big word. Yeah, it is. And it's, uh, you know, I'm choosing to be bold and stepping into it, but I am great. What type of mantra do you live by on a daily basis? Just to try and be 1% better than I was the day before. Um, I, I do lots of self-inventory. Yeah. You know, I do lots of self-stock take. Mm. I think it's it's something that comes along with uh, with the job description, so to speak, because I have to have a higher sense of awareness yeah. of self, of my surroundings. And, you know, my job has to do with reading in between the lines, actually, mm-hmm. you know, uh, listening to everything that people don't say. Yeah. So usually when I go back home and I do the stock take of the day, I will uh, take out a little marker or highlighter and then say, okay, these were the things that I am not so happy about. Um, what was my involvement with it or in it? Is it something that I can change? Is it something mm-hmm. I can change my mindset about? Um, so yeah, just yeah. constantly wanting to be a student and constantly wanting to be improved. That's that's my base. I would say sits at my baseline. We don't do that often as as people to to assess. We just live through life because eh? you know we deal with so much in this life experience of ours. You, you you're dealing with with sick kids and shortage of money and shortage of food. Uh, so for you to even find that, wh- where did you f- see the need to do a, a stock take? Uh, when you we, we, throughout uh, your life experience, we realized that there's a necessity for something like that. Yeah, I think um, to be honest with you, I think my earliest memory of of uh, uh, really assessing things is I got a whooping from my mom one day. Right? Okay. <laughs> my mom was a teacher. She was a uh, political activist, mm, mm. and she was a community leader and worked in worked for and in the church as well. Now okay. that's a lot. Okay, teacher, politician, church. Listen, that's there's everything. There's no room for me to be a stuff up. You know mm. what I mean? I need to. I need to be uh, <laughs> representing the upside of humanity over here. Because that's what she's doing. That's what she's doing, and <laughs> yeah. she led by example. Um, So I remember she gave me a whooping one day and I wasn't too happy about it. But I'm talking about, I was maybe like 11, 10 years old. Yeah. So I walked to her room and I knocked on the door and I could see that she was upset with herself because she lost her temper. Oh. Right. And that what was bothering her. So I went up to my mom and I remember I asked her, I said, "Um, have you had any kids before you've had me? Mm. And she looked at me. She was like, what? She's like, no. 
I said, okay. Um, have you ever had to raise anyone else's kids before you had me? Yeah, yeah. She goes, no, I never had to do that. She, so I asked her, so I said, so how do you know that what you are doing is right for me mm -hmm. when you have no experience in it? As a kid. And I told him, I said, I don't think the way things went down, I don't think I deserved that beating. Mm. Right? <laughs> and that was the first time I remember the look in my mom's face to, to say that this kid has a sense of awareness, you know, and a sense of self. Yeah. And she kind of like bolt on that. My parents and, you know, people around me, they bolt on that. But um, I think the things that made me do a lot of self-assessment were also the things that are kind of like tied to what can either progress me in life or it can make me destroy myself. Mm, mm. You know, yeah. the best of me and the worst of me. Yeah. And... um. I've been in experiences and I've had uh, life experiences where I've experienced the best of myself and I've also experienced the worst of myself. Yeah. And I had to go and debunk and understand what it means, you know, what is connected to the worst of yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, is it, yeah. uh, is it pressure that you put on yourself? Is it perfectionist issues? Is it people pleasing and then building up some form of self-resentment? And um, I think the great thing about the acting um, the craft of acting is you have to peel off the layers as much as you can to get to what the source is. That's true. So I was never scared of doing the self-work because I started realizing that within me knowing myself a lot better, I become better at what I do. That's it. Also, there's no competition for me then because I am me and they are them, period. And you are your own competition. All I need to focus on is what God has put, what path I've been put on. Yeah. what my purpose and what my mission is, what my strengths and what my weaknesses are, and that's it. I want to go back quickly to, to home, yeah. your upbringing. You're talking about your mom. Yes. Tell me about uh, Pal, the place where you were born. What type of environment was it when, when in those days? Well, from what uh, uh, my upbringing was like, uh, you know, the school that I went to, I didn't really go to a very privileged uh, it wasn't in a very privileged environment. Yeah. You know, um, if I can tell you like this, I was still at the tail end of the apartheid era. Mm -hmm. 86, you know. That's not a tail end. You were smack in the middle of it. You know, but I mean, it was the beginning of my life and for people that have been fighting for okay. a long time, you know, that was kind of like from there on. Mm. Yeah. My experience, it wasn't uh, uh, as deep as it was prior, maybe five or 10 years That's before true. then, you know? Yeah. Um, but I remember um, sitting in class one day and, you know, rubber bullets and tear gas started flying through the windows as uh, standard three as, mm, a, mm. as a school kid, you know? And then running outside and not seeing what's happening, seeing your school buddies get shot down by police. Jeez. You know, kids running for their life, scared teachers yeah. running yeah. for their lives. Uh, you know, they break out the hoses and hose the kids down. I remember being in classrooms and being five or six kids to one textbook. Mm -hmm. So whenever you had to do homework, you get to do it later in the week when someone else had the textbook for a long time. So your education was impeded yeah. and your right to an education was impeded. Mm -hmm. And um, I think all of these things were what made my mom and dad fight as hard as they did to make sure that there is some form of equality and we can just be perceived as human beings and mm. and all start on the same starting line, you know? Um, so for me, on the one end, I had that. My mom, um, being a primary school teacher and a political activist mm. and working for the church, uh, saw it fit that um, she needed to create some more extramural activities to keep the kids at school because most kids would only have their only meal at school. Mm. And even going back home, you know, there's either alcohol abuse, um, you know, physical abuse, domestic violence in the house, um, and also just, you know, uh, no work and hopelessness. Mm. It was better to keep the kids at school for as long as possible. So a lot of the time, my mom spent her time being at school and, uh, you know, not necessarily having that much time with my own family because they probably saw the need and they knew that there were others that had the bigger need. I would be fine because yeah. they are doing their best. Yeah. 
Um, and it was it was uh, how many kids in this in your household? It's just myself and my just younger you. sister. Yeah, yeah. She's, she's six years younger than I am. Vicky. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and mommy and daddy. It was uh, and mom and dad. Yeah. Four of us. Yeah. yeah. Not a big. Where, where's the rest of the extended family? Well, my mom is the youngest of eight. My dad was the youngest of nine. So they. Um, or vice versa, sorry, other way around. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do have a pretty big extended family. I can imagine. Yeah, with really, nine, yeah, nine siblings. Which was really great. Um, but yeah, growing up in Pa was also special for me because uh, I tell people today, I am a, I am a product of a lot of prayer. Mm. I'm a lot of, I'm, I'm a product of people's well wishes. I am a product of you know, people taking out the the time to, and, and teachers just always having an encouraging word to say to me and say, yeah. you know, you're going to be someone one day. You'll be all right. And also the, um, the motto, our school, primary school motto was aim high. And that's always stuck with me, you mm. know, to just have that mindset and visualize yourself further than what you are. See yourself in you know in 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 your highest form in your in your, in your highest capacity at your highest capacity yeah, yeah. and uh yeah so i I'm, I'm really fortunate i think my my background my upbringing has definitely shaped me yeah, yeah. And, and 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 the the aim high motto was it something that was also translated in in your home environment where who was the the one who was propelling this this positive both my parents yeah both my parents they were very ambitious people really intelligent people, kind-hearted, big-hearted people. I, I learned work ethic from them. Um, my dad was more of a, I would say, a dreamer, a guy that never finished high school, mm. uh, then left high school and then became a, a millionaire in, in his 20s because he just had passion and vision and drive. Wow. What, what he, type of business did he follow? So my dad actually started um, developing photos in in a dark room for a newspaper, for a printing company. What? <laughs> he ended up working himself up to the point where he had his own printing company. Yeah. Um, I think he had two. Um, uh, he had his own, like, a, a company called Lumber City. It used mm. to be what, uh, what do you call this? Boulder's Warehouse used okay. to be. Okay, like, yeah. yes, yes. And, then he, was, and then he was into insurance and insurance salesman. So he was a, a salesman by trade, you know. Yeah. But and it also, sounds like my passion as well. <laughs> you just yeah, like to listen, sell. My, da my dad showed <laughs> me something miraculous. My dad would be the type of guy to pull up to, when he started playing golf, right? Mm, mm. He was like, I think I'm going to get into golf. I was like, okay. So now I have to go out and, you know, carry his golf clubs. <laughs> I, mean, I, was, I hated it. Because <laughs> I was this overweight, short kid in the sun, yeah. Pale skin. It's not good for us, bro. You know, <laughs> sunburn. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I was always trying to be under the, the trees and yes. stuff. And I remember after a couple of rounds, uh, a couple of days playing, he he was really frustrated. Mm. And then he told me one day after having a beer, you know, he finished his game. He was like, <clears throat> I think I'm going to play with the pros next year. I think I'm going to beat these guys. Wow. I, was like, I was like, what? <laughs> next year came, came around. Uh, came back to me one day with his scorecard and he showed me his handicap was two. Whoa. So he was that guy. My dad would say, I'm going to go do this and it would be done, period. He was that wow. guy. He would manifest it. And he was always talking about, you know, the power of visualizing yeah. mindset. And then no one was really talking about that in our, in our sphere, you mm. know, in our environment. People were products of the environment most of the time and the areas that we came from there was a lot of hopelessness mm -hmm. and despair mm -hmm. you know you're not allowed to dream you're not allowed to dream beyond the parameters of what was set out mm -hmm. for you to be and here i had a i had a father who was defying that Jeez. um <laughs> and then i had a mother who was tenacious and Un, you know, no fear standing out in the front line yeah. at the age of 16 fighting for, for rights for our people, yeah. um, being threatened by the police, you know, burning down my dad's businesses, you know, having, having been, yeah, you know, going through all of those things at a very young age. And I mean, my parents also had me when they were young. Mm. Um, so I grew up with them. I had an opportunity to grow up with them. So yeah. from both sides, I've learned speak the truth, stand up for what's right, do 
do the right thing, even though everyone else might be going in the totally different direction. You be the one then mm. that puts it on yourself to not be like that. When you walk into a space, add credibility to it, add value to it, change mm. the atmosphere, change the environment, be that. You know, yeah. that's yeah. those were the lessons that I learned from my parents by by example. By example, yeah. yeah. Were they the type uh, to to sit down and say, "Son, let me show you. <laughs> this is how this is done." N- no, not really. No, no, not really. My yeah. dad, um, my dad was a businessman, but we've never really had business conversations. <laughs> That's I think, interesting. I think what's great about that is, you know, when I was younger, I was I was moaning about it. You know, I was mm. like, ah, this guy doesn't like me. He doesn't want to help me to move forward. Yeah. But actually, he taught me a very valuable lesson: is that every man should get to a point where you carve out who you are yourself. Yeah, be your own man. He showed me. He gave me other invaluable lessons you know mm. um so yeah i know uh, uh uh they weren't necessarily the type of people yeah. to sit down sit and down show and me how yes. things get done but they were never shy of support yes, you know yes. if i needed if i needed some form of correction they would find out what needs to be done so i can get the best you know but there is something to be said about exemplary uh parenting where you all you have to do is just do the right thing around your kids yeah that's what they're learning. <laughs> yeah, I told my wife, I said, yeah. I, put, I think I tweeted it one and I said, I think it's important for every kid to see their parents slay their giants. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's how you teach, teach them to fight. You know, yeah. you, when you get knocked down as a man or as a father, you know, the man of the house, if you get knocked down, it's important for your kid to see you get back up and fight. And if you get knocked back down again, you know, in your character and in your spirit, show what a fighting spirit looks yeah. like. That's how you teach them. Because kids learn from from watching. Yeah. And they do from from and there's hearing. No, and there's no <laughs> lying to them. You know, if you have double standards, they'll they'll also end up being someone with <laughs> double standards. They'll see that. Yeah. 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 They'll mirror it. Yeah. As a father. Uh, to your, to your, because uh, now you, you dead of the year. I'm, I'm not, I'm not aware. You, I'm not, I'm not sure if you know that. Yeah, I, know, I thought I <laughs> was infamous. You become dead. No, uh, you trust me. That there, there, there are more people who like like what you do uh, <laughs> than those who don't. That much I can tell you. The role of dead of of the year, and I'll I'll do that. I'll declare it here. <laughs> <laughs> that Clint is dead of the year. I don't care who says what. <laughs> Try to beat him. Eh? Are you aware of the the energy that you've created? of being this this exemplary dad and the dad who uh, forever showing that you know this is how this thing is done are you aware of this, <laughs> this no n- not not really not yeah. really um i've i've never had the mindset or the belief that you know the way that i do things should be followed or emulated by people uh i th- i think life is is um I don't think any of us is an expert in the life of anyone else. Mm. Most of us don't even know how we digest our food. So Mm. how can we even be, you know, (laughs) have an opinion about the life of anyone else? So uh, I I just like um, the way that I learned how to become better as a human being, as an artist, as a musician, was by following the lives of other people. I would check their lives out. I would see the results of their lives. I will see if, you know, I resonate with any of their characteristics. Mm -hmm. You know, if if there's any resemblance between our stories, our difficulties, I could learn from them. And then I would crunch the numbers and then make, turn that story into my own story. And that's, I just do my best to share. But I do believe that there is a need for lots of positivity in the world. There's, There's a need for dialogue. There's a hunger and a thirst for true connection, authentic connection. And I think so many people struggle to just be authentic and be themselves um, that they don't even know what that is like anymore because life is just showing this comparative success to all of us and shoving it down our throats. And, Mm. you know, this is what success looks like. And if you don't have that, you're not successful. And a lot of that nonsense, I just don't agree with. What kind of success is success to you? Peace in your life. Mm-hmm. is massive success because you can have a lot of money and not have peace. You can have all the business in the world and not have peace and it won't mean nothing to you. Mm-hmm. You just keep on chasing. So I would say if you can operate from a point where there is peace, either you being with and understanding that there are fundamental truths about life. Mm-hmm. And one of the fundamental truths about life is that life is suffering, period. 
you try and avoid it, you will just cause more conflict for yourself somewhere along the line, you know, yeah. accept it, see the beauty in it, see that there's a growth factor and lessons within it, you know? And then I think from there on, you can just like experience uh, an exponential experience of life. Yeah, yeah. Let's go back to the fatherhood thing that you're doing. Um, it's it's created followers and naysayers. Yeah. <laughs> It's created those that that absolutely love what you do and those that say, this guy, how yeah. many kids do you have? Just one. Just one. Yeah, for now. <laughs> for now. Yes. And 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 getting all the love in the world, clearly. It's the paradigm shift I've I've been wanting for a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. I've for, for a very long time I've wanted a different experience of myself. And um the experience that I've been having of myself for the last couple of years, you know, uh, has been a, a, a tough one at times to make peace with mm. because I find, I found myself being in a space where I, my, my gift overqualifies me, but my environment doesn't want to see me grow. Mm -hmm. And that's a difficult struggle for any man to be in, yeah. to show up battle tested, prepared, knowing that you are qualified and only after your efforts you find out that your goalposts get moved. Jeez. Now, if you if you have that experience once or twice, three, four, five times, you can still attribute to it to like, maybe there's room for improvement. I need to go back to the drawing board. I need to mm -hmm. improve, you know, and dissect the situation. But if that becomes the constant experience you have of yourself, for any man, that's like dying a small death every day, mm. you know? And that's kind of like what I was experiencing in the entertainment industry. Everyone would tell me, yo, bro, you're so great. You are so fantastic at what mm. you're doing. You are so talented. And at the same time, I had people say, we can't work with you because you're so talented and I'm not that talented. Ooh. So therefore, I need to wait till I'm on your level to work with you. I'm like, Jeez. this is the this is new. Mm. <laughs> like, this is new. So maybe you should dumb down your own skills. You know what <laughs> so I mean? So it matches up. Others. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I thought to myself, and I'm like, but I I am not capable of doing that. Yeah, Jeez. I'm not capable. You know, there's a scripture that says, you know, once you've tasted how sweet the Lord is, there's you can't go back. <laughs> mm. You know, there's mm. there's there's, it, it, there's there's a change that has happened, yeah. and um, also because because I, I I love what I do, I really love what I do. I will go into that thing as deep as I can to discover myself within mm. it. Mm. And also stand within the truth of what that thing is, and um, so it was. A, it was a really, and I'm talking creatively. Mm -hmm. That was the type I'm of experience. Yeah. That, was a, that was the type of experience I had for a couple of years. And uh, when my daughter was born, you know, instant priority shift. <laughs> Big blessing for someone that's an overthinker like me, yeah. who uh, struggles with perfectionist issues. Um, to now have an opportunity to not think about myself so much. Mm, that's a big you know, change. Or, or yeah, or the things that I'm concerned about and trust that things will be provided for. Mm. Uh, what it has done for my relationship is, is just taking the love that I have for my wife and my family to a level that I didn't know was, was possible really, you know. Yeah. Oh, uh, because of a, of a kid. Yeah. <laughs> and the experience of that kid and what it's done to my wife and the type of mother she is and um, the sacrifice that goes along with being a parent. And immediately, I mean, I, I became a dad at the age of 42, right? Mm, mm. So actually the way I was looking at it was 42 years, I was still only someone's kid. Mm. I, was only, I was only in the child capacity for 42 years. Yes. <laughs> and then being in the parent capacity instantly gave me a lot more respect, love and compassion and understanding for my own parents. Mm, now you got to understand Man. what they went through. And as soon as that happened, as a couple of months after that, I lost my dad. You know, he Ooh. passed he passed away on the first of August. Mm. And um Ooh. he had an opportunity. I had both sets of my parents yeah. in our house when my wife gave birth to my to my daughter in our house what? right in the living room and they had the opportunity to hold her the first day the first hour that she was so born. it was a home birth it was a home birth yeah yeah 
which was also another like mind blowing moment for me and, and you know and a big connection between my wife myself yeah. and and uh, our family they were both there they were both there my, <laughs> the, my, my, the dads were like don't ever do this to us again we had to lie in the rooms and hear all of this you know <laughs> screaming and stuff going on I never want to experience this again <laughs> Jeez, <man. laughs> um, but yeah like I said you know the, uh, having a kid is is really seeing the miracle of life yeah you look like you can't help yourself, but just do the, be a great dad because that's how it comes across. What is a great dad? I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> All I'm really doing is just uh, trying my best to not waste a minute. I've, I think I've been through enough to understand the value of time, to understand the value of the human connection and mm. the human experience. It's so layered. It's so intricate, yet it's so simple and mm. it can be so painful and bitter. But, you know, uh, I think uh, the poet Khalil Gibran said uh, the things that, and I'm paraphrasing, the mm. things that end up giving you sorrow were the things that initially gave you joy and that's why you have sorrow, you know. And for the first time in my life, I know what it feels like to walk with gratitude in the one hand and grief in the other hand and just be stretched large by both of them. And it's 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 an amazing experience for me because when I was younger and I suffered loss or I suffered heartbreak, mm. that would just be the blanket that covered every 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 other experience mm. that I would have. Even the most joyous experience. Even the most joyous. Yeah. And I could just couldn't find myself to look at things joyfully. Mm. And now, man, it's something else when you've had a really hard day emotionally, you have no one to talk to, or you feel like, you know, the person that you would reach out to is no longer available for you. And you're sitting with all of these thoughts and feelings and stuff and you walk into your house and you greet your wife and here's this person who just lights up as soon as they see you and they smile. <laughs> yeah, everything just leaves. Everything just goes away. Yeah. Yeah, that's there's a, amazing. There's a, there's a comedian that, that says uh, he, he likes cats. He doesn't like dogs because dogs, they're too bloody excited. <laughs> <laughs> These damn things are too excited. Yeah. I'm moody. I'm unhappy. I want to stay this way. Yeah. I want to. I want to. I want to soak in my in my sadness. Yeah, marinate in it. Marinate in my sadness, and this damn thing comes wiggling. Yeah. It's, hey, what's it's, up? It's, hey, where you been? Hey, hey, hey. 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 What's Listen, going on? Yeah, you know what's what happening? I mean? Yeah. I, it's like, he says he likes cats because they just look at you and say, "Oh, it's you." And then they move on. <laughs> so the experience. Uh, goodness, I'm a dog guy. <laughs> see, I'm a dog guy too. So the experience you, you, you're talking about, you know, with, with your with your child is exactly the is the yeah. dog version of love. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's just like completely just melts everything. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When life is hard, well, there's this person who's happy to see you. Jeez. You know something I I, I know, and it's about about seeing kids grow over a long period, which is what pa parenting is. You see them in different stages. Yeah. And there's a stage you wish you could bottle. This stage you're going through now of constant joy and constant happy to see you. Because they will go through a stage where you'll be a complete irritation. Yeah, in you'll lives. be the most annoying person that they know. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to be that. If, if Ariel, if you see this one day, I said it here first, mm. you know it now. What I will do, is I'm going to annoy my daughter back. <laughs> I'm going to be that dad that picks her up in, at school. Yeah. Dressed like the Backstreet Boys, you know, <laughs> Backstreet's back. Yeah. All right, I'm going to do the whole moves and pick you up in front of your friends. Whoa, yeah. you'll be that dad. <laughs> I'll be that dad. It's like, dad, don't come fetch me today. Yeah. Your mom couldn't come get you today, so I'm on my way. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. I, I must tell you, wh what do you think is it that some people don't particularly like this this persona of yours? Because I said earlier that it gets it gets those that say, wow, I wish yeah. my dad, I wish my husband, and I wish yeah. I could be this type of dad. Well, I think it's just that, you know. Yeah. It's exactly that. And um, that brings my attention to the fact that there is a that there is a serious need for that. Mm -hmm. There's a serious need for us to communicate. There's a serious need for us to connect, you know. And it's difficult for, you know, I would say men of color to be vulnerable, mm -hmm. you know. We come from a past and from an upbringing where you, you cannot show, you can't show that there's blood in the water because there's sharks. You're going to yeah. get eaten. You know, mm. you can't do that. Yeah. It's, it's just not safe for you to, to have that option. Mm. But I think things have changed where there are ways to do it. And um, I know also coming from the backgrounds that we do come from, you know, uh, we have lots of single parent homes. Most of them, mom's raising the kids, dad's not around for mm. whatever reason. 
dads came from a lineage where his dad wasn't around, so he never knew how to be a man, you know? And he never had the opportunity and the mentorship to unpack who he really is. Yeah. So, you know, we we buried under um, being a workaholic, mm. an alcoholic, you know, recreational drugs. Mm. You know, men find themselves uh, losing themselves in, in, in women, looking actually for pieces of themselves or something that can remind them of what it is like to, to know love and to be loved. Mm. And the ripple effects of what that has done to communities and Africa as a nation is evident. Mm. It's evident in the way that we treat each other. It's evident in the way that we love each other and the lack of love and understanding and compassion that we have for yeah. each other. So I think what could trigger people is that I am, I'm, I'm showing a different version. I'm showing a different suggestion, a different option. Mm. I'm saying go out there and love your wife. Yes, you're a king, but you know, wife is a king maker. Mm. Mm. If you treat her the way that she deserves to be treated, and nourish her properly and, and, and put her in soil where she can actually become her best, you will, it, that, you know, it feeds back into your home. It feeds back into yeah. someone that loves you, the, you know, equally as much. So, and um, I'm pretty big on that, man. Yeah. I, I, I want people to get to the point where the life experience and the experience that they have on themselves should be uh, a positive one and have some form of evolution to it. Mm -hmm. Your your story suggests that you grew up in an environment where you were you were different, maybe maybe lighter skinned in relation to those around you. Yeah, tell us more about that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's that used to be a thing. I think it's still a thing. Yeah. Colorism, oh, if we course. have to call it that, yes. you know. Yeah. Um, and the and the difficult thing I still find actually in 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 entertainment business today, funny mm. enough is that people think because I'm light-skinned, I never had uh, hard times. <laughs> it's the weirdest thing, you know. They, well, this here's your platform to clarify You know, that. people look at you and they think like, ah, probably he, Model C school, you know, dad mm, got him everything he wanted. Had it easy. You had it easy, you know. Not true. Yeah. Not true. And I think uh, a lot of people who've either had that um, idea of who I could be, if they've ever been on a set with me and they've worked with me, they will see that my work ethic mm. shows them a lot different. You yeah. know, yeah. I work like I was started when I started in the industry. I'm hungry. Mm. Yeah, I'm not complacent. I don't take things for granted yeah. because I never, I know for a fact what my parents had to sacrifice and the sacrifice that was paid for me to just have an opportunity to get a foot in the door. I know that, you know, being, being this color uh, and being a minority demographic in South Africa, mm. I don't have an option to be good. I need to be exceptional just to be seen. Yeah. And even if I'm exceptional, that is, that's no guarantee that I will move ahead mm -hmm. or move, you know, or, or get what, what my talent and, and my gifting deserves. deserves. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, So the environment you were in, how different were you? I was a lot more... I'm a, I would say I'm, I'm kind of like a slow starter. Okay. You know, initially I was really careful. I would take my time assessing things, assessing people, assessing the situation. Yeah. I listened more and more than I talk, mm -hmm. you know. And, um, and I think the way that I had to uh, apply myself at a young age to get to where I want to be, I realized early on I wasn't going to be great in sport because... Uh, I went to school at the age of five. Okay. Uh, I turned five. So everyone was like two, three years older than me in okay. my class. They developed earlier than I did. So whenever we had to go for tryouts, and you know, I went to a ghetto school. You know, mm. you get guys in your class when you stand at seven with a full beard, working <laughs> a part-time job while he's at school. <laughs> I got to go compete against those guys and get tackled by a grown man. Yeah. <laughs> so you didn't... When I'm 12 years old, yeah. I'm like, no. Jeez. And um, but because I participated in the Isteadfords from grade one, okay. grade so one, so music was already there. Acting and music was yeah. there from day one, and it showed me and gave me a path because I started getting recognition and well known regionally and then nationally, mm. um, to the point where it became my career. But so growing up in that environment, it was difficult because also if you're light skinned from my neighborhood, you're a target. You're a walking target for all the gangs, man. Hmm. You know, they see you coming from afar. Ah, this guy. 
but I'd have had say, you know, you know, muggings or people Jeez. trying to, you know, I've had a firearm stuck in my face a couple of times. Whoa. Even at school level, I've been through it, you know. Jeez. Um, so we come from that background. Mm, mm, you had to, you had to man up. <laughs> no, you had to man <laughs> or up. Hide. Or hide. And you know, there's no, if you hide now and you keep on hiding, yeah. you're going to be a victim for the rest of your life. So mm. there comes a time where you have to draw the line and that's that. Yeah. And then stand for something. So uh, um, I think also coming from Paul and what my dreams were, I couldn't find, I couldn't really find a mentor who's been on the other side of the wall mm. to tell me what success looks like and how to get it. I really just had to roll the dice and go, you know, this, out of everything I've done, you know, a lot of my people, my family, they are academics. That's their passion. They want to go down that route. You know, there's uh, the sports people in Paul. I mean, you can see now the spring box full of Paul guys. Mm -hmm. There we go, bro. Mm. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I was like, uh, okay, well, there's this art route. Yeah. But uh, where did you see it from, though? It must have started I somewhere. Saw, I, saw, I just watched TV one day and I pointed at the TV screen and I told my dad, I said, I'm going to do that one day. And he said, what? I said, I'm going to be there. He goes, where's there? I said, there with the TV people. I'm going to do that stuff. Inside that She's box. Like, How are you going to do it? Yeah. And as a kid, I just said that I'm going to do that. And um, I remember I was on the train one day on my way to university. Mm. And uh, I think it was the first day of university. And... Uh, a lot of the guys, you know, that went to school with me uh, and our rival schools, we kind of knew each other because mm. of the derbies and the sports yeah. and stuff. So you you have a, a lot of people on the train in the carriage going either to Cape Tech or Stellenbosch mm, University mm. or UCT or whatever, you know, and we're all together. And this, a couple of people are saying, you know, I'm studying civil engineering, mechanical engineering. Oh, I said, Clint, what are you going to do? I said, yo, I'm studying acting. I'm going to be an actor. And I remember the entire carriage burst out laughing. Bro. Really? They were like, what? How are you going to do that? <laughs> and that thing got me so mad, bro. I was so cross and embarrassed that I told myself, I'm going to, everyone in this carriage that laughed will have a day where they have a nice big bowl of their words. I'm going to have to munch on it while they see me doing what I'm doing, really. <laughs> and I've always had that type of mindset where, if you tell me I am not capable, I will show you that I'm very, very capable. So it got you fired up. It got me mad fired up. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, it just led to everything else and, mm. and me just applying myself. I remember I broke my ankle in a, in a basketball game that I was playing and I had to go to university and I had to go, uh, I had an operation done. Mm. I tore both my ligaments. I had to have reconstructive <sighs> surgery done on my ankle. My basketball career was done. And I remember I had to take the train, walk with the crutches to the train station, get onto the train, mm. get off at Cape Town Station. If I either, I, and now I need to check, okay, do I have enough money to take the taxi to get to Varsity? It's either I take the taxi to get to Varsity and then I don't have money to buy myself something to eat. Mm. <laughs> to make choices. So I've got to choose. And oftentimes I would walk with crutches from Cape Town Station all the way up Kloof Street Jeez. to get, and it was far, man, I think an hour and a half on crutches. I would get, I would get to the Varsity first thing in the morning, seven, eight o'clock in the morning with bruised hands, smelling like sweat, mm. dirty cast on my leg. And sitting in class with people whose dad just bought them a Porsche for their birthday. Jeez. <laughs> and I had to compete with all of these people who had a lot of privileges. And all I had was fire in the belly mm. and, and prayers from my hometown people and my parents. And the need to prove to those guys and in the, the need, <laughs> And listen, and those guys, I had, I made a bet with myself that that's what's going to happen, you know. Yeah. And um, I'm thankful for it. What kept you going, though, under those type of circumstances that you, you describe, where it was tough, but you just never stopped? You know, I, my eyes had to open up from a young age. Um, there was a time where uh, uh, things were just not cool at, at home anymore. You know, mm -hmm. financial difficulty hit us. Um, especially, like I mentioned before, with my, with my parents, their political affiliation mm -hmm. uh, and the apartheid era and, uh, you know, how, th how people were able to, to do things then that couldn't be traced afterwards, you know, and really destroying the lives and careers of many mm -hmm. people. Um, I could assess by the tension that was in the house 
that something needed to happen. And I realized that if I do not take up responsibility to start becoming a contributor to the betterment of my environment, mm -hmm. we're all going to drown. We're all going to have a really difficult time. So I also just felt seeing that no one else in my, in my community at that point in time has really achieved anything in the arts remotely close to what I wanted to achieve. I, mm. I just felt like, well, there's no one else that I can ask for help. It's just me. So I'm going to have to go do something that hasn't been done before. And I trusted that, that voice. I trusted my inner voice. I trusted my ability. And I trusted that if I work hard enough, I'll get it. And that's what I did every day. And every setback just reminded me, you know, whenever I felt life either gave me like a huge disappointment or a death blow, I would just go like, but that's still not enough for me to give up. I'm still mm. not done. I'm still not where I want to be. So I just kept on, on chopping away, you know, bit by bit. I think the thing that, that differentiated me and set me apart from a lot of people around me was not necessarily that I was more talented. I just didn't want to quit. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I just didn't want to quit. You know? Even when the going was tough. Especially when the going got tough. Yeah. I didn't want to be that guy. Also because the environment that I grew up in, I, there were many moments where I felt really weak. And I had to go and with my head on my pillow at night to wrestle with the feelings of what it feels to be weak. Mm. You know? Uh, and, and I mean, sport taught me that I had people who were four years older than me more matured, you know, bigger body. And I couldn't, you know, I couldn't stand up for myself. I couldn't fend for myself on that level. And it frustrated me deeply. Mm -hmm. And uh, I needed to find something to firstly uh, feel anchored within myself that what it is that I'm doing, I'm, I'm good at it. I'm really, really good at it. And uh, yeah, man, it, it, it's, it's just stuck with me till now. Incredible. Because, uh, you know, when I pace through the stuff that I've read about about you, that attitude comes across quite a bit. That relentless pursuit for what what it is that you want to achieve. Because you say you're not a sportsman, but there are those who know that side of your personality. Yeah. You know, as the as the gym guy. Yes. <laughs> you know, and you say you're not a natural sports guy. It's it wasn't something that was yeah. that was yeah that was part of your 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 mindset. Yes. Yeah. And but you kept on trying these things and never stopped. 100%. I had to find what was mine. Yes. And also, it's it's difficult. For me, still it's difficult when the world gives me a no, but inside me there's a resounding yes. Yeah. Then I will go out and test myself. And I will go out and test that theory if it really is a no for me. Yeah. And um, I think that's exactly what I did with the Muay Thai thing. You know, I've, I've sparred with top boxers in the country. Yeah. I've you know, gone round with the South African lightweight Muay Thai champion. Mm. Um, I've really tested myself as far as I could go without going pro, obviously, because I was already, I was like, I started the sport when I was 27 years old. Mm. I'm not going to compete. Well, I, I had my first competition at, at 27, 28. I'm like, I'm not going to go compete against someone <laughs> who their only job is to train like this. I got three jobs. I'm running my own music <laughs> label. Yeah. You, know, and it's, you know, that's just not a wise thing. Um, but still, I wanted to get as close to the discomfort of myself as possible. Yeah. And I still believe that doing that will get you to, will, will really give you the best results. I think, and right now, if I have to be honest, the uncomfortability, the, <laughs> the uncomfortability with being in the entertainment industry right now is being real. Mm -hmm. Not adopting what the entertainment business wants you to be because you. now it's it's now it's a game of emulating what's out there. You know, looking like everyone else looks, mm. sounding like everyone else sounds, you know, wearing what everyone else wears because, you know, if you don't have that, you're not validated, you're not verified, you're mm. not blue tag, blue ticked or whatever, yes. you know, you know, yes. blue badge, you don't have any of those things. Now and, you, you can buy the blue badge. You know what I mean? Yes. And for me, that then became, the uncomfortability in that would be like, but what would an artist look like mm. with 
no theatrics. I'm not giving you any theatrics over mm. here. Mm. I didn't rock up to your podcast and <laughs> big ass sunglasses and the chain, yeah. entourage of five people okay. to make you believe that my talent is big. Mm. That's got nothing to mm. do with my ability. Yeah. It's theatrics. It's a game. It's a gimmick at the end of the day. And I'm not big on gimmicks. That's you know? true. Yeah. But the difficulty within the entertainment industry like that right now is they don't know where to place real. Because mm. a lot of times they don't want people to wake up to the illusion. That's not fair. You know, we want to keep you in the bubble. We want to keep you there as a mm. viewer so we mm. can have that dialogue and you pay me and I just, you know, we just keep it going. <laughs> you keep like going. That. Yes. Yeah. Almost, Not, almost like a, like a, a, a cartoon character or it's, yeah. a cre it's a created reality. Yeah, it's a persona that yeah. a lot of people create, you know, and people buy into that. It's an escape. It's like the dream within the dream. But the the real then then uh, when when the curtains close and the lights are off, yeah, you still have to live your real life. You still have to live your real life, and a lot of people live with a lot of dysfunction. Yeah, you know, a lot of dysfunction. What I, type of dysfunction would you describe? Man, for example, I'll, look, I'll be honest with you. I looked at some of the greatest artists in South Africa. I don't want to name names because mm -mm. I have a lot of respect for their artistry and their crafts and stuff like that. And it's also their life stories inspired me. It, it, it motivated me to also want to reach great heights. But a lot of the greats that we've had in our country were drug addicts or alcoholics had mm. estranged relationships with their children. Mm. You know, their children still resenting them years after they have passed. And that's not the type of legacy I would like to leave. That's also not the type of trade-off that I think I need to sell the rest of my life mm. for my craft. Yeah. For one avenue. Mm. I, it, look, I'll be dead honest with you. If I had to pass away and people, all people had to say was Clint Brink was a great actor. I've lived a poor life. Mm. If that's all you know me to be, you know? You're happy with, with that type of descrip description of the life you lived. Yeah, yeah. you know, that's, that's definitely not what I want for myself. Mm. I think that's one of the things that I do. It's, it's, it's the gift that I have. It's mm. one of the gifts that I have. But it's not completely definitive of my entire life. Mm. It is just one part of it. Yeah, yeah, I think the types of conversations that we have right now is way more important mm. because the talent is the gift. It's also the vehicle that takes you to the places where you actually have an opportunity to assess what the real change, the requirements of the real change is yeah. or are. You know what I mean? Let's go to a time uh, about how far your singing took you when you were a kid. Yeah. Because it took you places. It, it, you yes. didn't just stay... You were not a, a star in PAL. <laughs> you became a star outside South Africa as well. Yes. When when the, your group traveled and so forth. Tell, take us to that yes. moment. Man, um, so as the, the singing, the music thing is, is, is really special to me because there's a couple of things attached to the music story to me as well. One, um, when I was in primary school, uh, I remember, I think, uh, Sub B. Mm, stand that's that's, yeah, that's grade. seven, seven, <laughs> six, seven, eight year yeah. old. That's that age. Grade two. Yes. And uh, they had this uh, this show, uh, right, at school. And um, there was the Baker's Man and, you know, all of these other stalls and, and mm. the kids would sing and then act out. And they told me, they said as a kid, they said, look here, you just do the actions, but don't sing, right? <laughs> as a kid, you go, okay, cool, you know, and that's what I'm doing. Um, then the Paul Wellington Regional Choir came around and auditioned mm. to have kids be a part of the of the regional choir. And I remember I went in there and at first they were like not convinced by me. Mm. And one of the school teachers said, no, 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 actually one of the, uh, the primary school teachers said, no, he's, he's not ready. Mm. Um, I, I don't think you should take him. And the, teacher from the of the Paul Regional of the Paul Wellington Regional Choir said mm. no he's just young he just needs some time mm. and um so the, he, they spotted their uh, talent they spotted yeah. talent yeah and I stayed with the choir for the majority of my schooling career I sang in my so I would sing in my school choir mm -hmm. and then the regional choir and wow. then when I got into high school I started becoming part of a boys a cappella group that traveled a lot wow and I was more on the arrangement side um, because we had really two strong lead vocalists, you know, mm -hmm. and um, I was still developing my voice, finding out who I was yeah. um, within music. And um, I only developed a whole lot later, you know. And then after that happened, after I left high school, uh, 
It was actually shortly after backstage that I decided to pursue music. Mm, wow. Because uh, Jonathan Butler was one of the the first artist that we had perform on the show backstage. Mm. And I've heard Jonathan Butler on the radio. I've heard people talk yeah. about him. I always thought that he was this international guy, <laughs> you know. And Just then, a guy from, from the cup. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. And then um, when I saw him sing right in front of me for the first time, they couldn't get a reaction shot on me. The cameraman couldn't take a reaction shot on me because my tears were just flowing like this. What? Because I never, I've never in my life seen someone that gifted. It mm. blew me away. And I remember I walked off set and I sat behind the piano and I started playing there a little bit. And I f felt a tap on my shoulder and I turned around and it was Jonathan Butler. And he was like, so you're a musician? <laughs> I'm like... No, mm, yes, okay. well, you know, I'm trying to be. He goes, well, you're playing the piano. Do you have any original songs? Yes. I said, yeah, I do. And I played a piece of it. He said, that's really nice. Do you have a demo? I'm like, a demo? He goes, yeah, like a, mm. a CD with your songs mm. on it. Mm. I said, no, I don't have a demo. He goes, okay, well, if you can record some of your songs and bring the demo, I'm staying at this hotel at the waterfront. We can connect. Wow. I was like, damn. Spoke to one of my ex uh, high school friends and I'm like, yo, Jonathan Butler just said we need to give him a demo. That guy <laughs> quit his job right there. He <laughs> drove for six hours to get to Cape Town. We, record <laughs> we wow. recorded a song in a small studio. The sound engineer was a chain smoker. Mm. We had a flat mic like this and two guys singing into the flat mic, you know. <laughs> so there were a lot of things that just ended up the demo not sounding as great <laughs> as our <laughs> intentions would have wanted yes. it to be. Wow. Anyway, I went to him, I met up with him, he listened to it. He was really nice. Yeah. And he was like, oh, the really nice song, guys. And um, he was like, so... um. So what are you guys doing tomorrow evening? I said, mm. well, nothing. He's like, okay, well, I'm going to invite you guys to the North Sea Jazz Festival. Jeez. I was like, okay, cool. That's so a big show. The, you know, so we in the front row, some of the backstage cast members, Jonathan Butler's on stage performing at the North Sea Jazz Festival. And he points at me and he says, I'm like, what? No. He says, come join me. So... Musa Manzini, the late Musa Manzini. We used to work with you guys on backstage. He was the musical director of the show. Yeah. Right? And Musa Manzini was also one of my mentors. He was the guy that took me under his wing and said, this is how you write a song. This is mm. what a, the structure of a song needs to look like. As a songwriter and as an instrumentalist, this is how you sonically build music. You know, mm. this is what we do. And he exposed me to a lot of artists and him being one of the jazz legends we had we had in this country or have in this country you know um musa was playing bass for jonathan at the okay. gig okay wow well there you go so i it's two people you know on stage <laughs> two people i know on stage and jonathan butler uh did a song and the chorus of the song was sung by an artist uh named neville d okay kicked on very talented singer yeah. very talented artist and i knew the the chorus of the song right and um Jonathan Butler was like, okay, so you're going to sing the song. So I sang the choruses. I just <laughs> closed my eyes and was like, hey, man, you know, whatever happens, happens. Yeah. I closed my eyes and I sang. And I remember opening my eyes and looking around and I saw the bait. Musa was laughing. The keyboardist was laughing. But, you know, musicians have that thing is when you hit the spot, it's like an involuntary yeah. laugh, you know. Yeah. They either pull the face, you know. The <laughs> <laughs> or it's like people, they just end up laughing, right? Yeah. And I remember Jonathan Butler stopped the band and he was like, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Paul. He said, you know, Boys to Men used to be five members. I think you were the fifth member, man. You're Whoa. great in, in front of everyone. And still... That wasn't enough for me to believe in myself. What? You know, because funny enough, my musical journey started with a lot of resistance and people in authoritative positions telling me that I don't have the ability mm. to be great mm. and never getting that opportunity to be great. And once again, I had to go fight for my own spotlight. So people's voices held you back. Well, what do you do when you're, when you're a child and, yeah. and, and established people speak to you and tell you that where you're going is not possible for you to do because they can't envision it, they can't see it, they can't hear it. Huh. And remember, a lot of things are comparative. Mm. So people compare what you sound. And this, this is why, one of the reasons why a lot of people won't find me doing a lot of cover versions. Because cover versions give the layman an opportunity to then... Compare, measure you yeah. against the real thing and then and then deciding on that if whether you're, you're great, good or not whether you're good or not <laughs> 
But I found that, but what happens if I write my own material? Mm. What happens if I make my own material? Mm. Then I don't have to be compared to anyone else. Yeah. If you take a listen to people like Joe Cocker, yes. you know, with that rough voice, how is he going to end up to be a lead singer? People disputed Michael Bolton and said, you know, he shouldn't mm. be singing, mm -hmm. you know. And then I looked at people like my hero, Stevie Wonder, Donny Hathaway, Brian McKnight, yeah. Earth, Wind & Fire, you know, all of the, the Motown era. And when I started diving into people's histories and backgrounds and where they came from, I saw that they had to, a lot of these people had to overcome adversity. So this was just mine. You know, being in a being an environment where people haven't seen anything or heard anything like this before. So therefore, mm. they don't know what to do with it. And I had to really lock down and believe in myself enough and my ability. But I have to share the story with you. Yeah. So I'm in high school. Brian McKnight was my one of my top artists as a teenager. You know, mm. we're talking about a guy that plays multi-instrumentalist, singer-songwriter, mm. has crazy range, can do all of the riffs has this great tonality and whatever, right? Um, and I walked home from school one day trying to sing a Brian McKnight song. My voice was cracking all the way, man. <laughs> and I remember I got so angry. I took my backpack off and I threw it on the ground like this. And I started crying as a 14-year-old boy, 15-year-old boy. Right? You were judging your own... Myself. Yeah. And, and I hated what I sang <laughs> because and I, and I struggled. And I promise you this, brother. I, I walked down the road... And I started having a real big conversation with God. And I said, why would you make me love something so much and make me so bad at it? Jeez. <laughs> I said, that is the cruelest thing you can do to anyone. Mm. So therefore, I don't want to have any more feelings attached to this thing. I don't want to have anything to do with it, whatever. And I'm venting and venting. And it's just me on my way home, mm. talking up at the sky. <laughs> you know, a teenage complaining boy. Complaining to God. Complaining to God, saying that this, I was like... And just as I took the turn to go down the road where we stayed, I said, but hold up. How's about we make a deal? Mm. <laughs> Compromise. Let's hear I said, it. I said, come on now. Come <laughs> on now, God. Give me the ability to do this thing. Mm. And whenever people ask me, how are you able to do this thing? I will say where I got it from. Yeah. Right? <laughs> that was the last thing I said right before I walked into our, yeah. our front door. I went to my room. I had a nap. I woke up, uh, the phone rang. I spoke to my friend, Kurt. Mm. Kurt was like, Kurt, uh, Kurt Swan. He was like, yo, man, when's the last time you listened to Stevie Wonder? I'm like, Stevie Wonder's old stuff, man. Mm. Who's listening to Stevie oh, Wonder? Oh, you, you were know? not into Stevie. No, I mean, I'm a teenager, you yeah. know. We listen to boys to men, you know. We're trying to be on that <laughs> R&B. <laughs> and I was listening to these old guys, man. What mm. old music? He says, yeah, go listen to a song called Ribbon in the Sky. I'm like, okay. Yeah. Went downstairs, I listened to Ribbon in the Sky. Blew me away, fell in love with Stevie Wonder all over again. I sat behind the piano. I played it a bit. I sang it. I'm like, hold up. But I'm, I'm nailing this song. Mm. <laughs> 20 minutes ago, I couldn't sing a Brian McKnight song. Where on the scale, Brian's song ended up here and I couldn't hit this note. Stevie's mm. is higher and I'm hitting that. How is that possible? And that little voice said, didn't you just ask me for... And I didn't want to believe it, bro. Yeah. I didn't want to believe it. I didn't want to believe it. For me, it was like, but that's impossible. Mm. It's it's impossible. That doesn't happen. <laughs> that that that's can a, just happen that's, that's so fairy, easily. That's a fairy tale, man. These yeah. things don't happen yeah. to people. Man, years later, I put out a couple of singles. Most of the singles went number one. Yeah. I've never had PR, publicity, team behind me. I do everything by myself. Mm. So it was hard work, lots of man hours, right? Hmm. And then all of a sudden, all of the singles that I started releasing just went nowhere. Mm. And I'm like, what's going on? And then one day, while I was walking the dogs, my wife was on Survivor. And I was walking the dogs and I had this conversation with the Lord again. And I'm like, man, I just put out a, an EP with four songs. I worked with these guys from Neisner because I believed in their talent and no one will give them a leg up because no one gave me a leg up. So I stood in the gap with these guys and my intentions, intentions were really good mm -hmm. and, you mm -hmm. know, they're talented. But wh why, I, Lord, you know, I, I know I shouldn't be asking these things, but why <laughs> didn't anything happen? And I got this resounding drop in my spirit that said, your... Your forward going movement and your approval mm. does not come from man. I give it. I gave you your life. I gave you your talent. Mm. I will give you your position. Yeah. And what is more important? 
to be known by millions or to have intimate time with me when you are performing your gift. And mm. that gave me a lot, man. That just made me stop and made me realize that we get so focused on the end goal, you know. And uh, listen, in the music game, you should know more than anyone else. Mm. There are so many... There are so many elements to consider. It's not just about talent. It's not just about effort. Absolutely. It could be about timing. It could mm. be in the right room, talking to the right people, yeah. the right eyes, the right ears on you at the right time. I know many people who are super talented who just didn't get the ear that they deserve yeah. for them to have that the breakthrough. Breakthrough that seems break, impossible. You know, that breakthrough yeah. seems impossible. And um, it was just put in me again that, but Clint, mm. you know, whether millions of people know that you have the ability or whether only four people know that you have ability does not take the fact away that you have that ability. Yeah. So even if no one knows, your ability is still there. It's still in action. It can still happen. It, I guess it was the, the measuring tool that you are applying was that it should be the millions that that see it for it to be great. Yeah, because, I mean, that's kind of like what we are taught as well. You know, and it's and, the and numbers. It's 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 the numbers. <laughs> yeah. You know, otherwise, and 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 this is the thing. As a young guy, I also started like, and that's that thing about comparative success. Mm. You know, you look at things and you go like, yeah, but I'm achieving this with the works of my hands, and I'm doing all of this. But then, the older you get, and you start running your own business, and you start seeing, but you need more hands on deck. That's true. You know, yeah. if you wanna if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far. Mm. have people with you have a That's team it, yeah. um, but what I wanted to say was while I was walking the dogs the question came back to me is like remember you and I signed an agreement <laughs> when you were a kid when you were a kid yeah. and then you had the ability and then you had number ones and then it was all you bro it was all you mm. remember you forgot you said you were going to mention <laughs> you know us you're gonna give me credit you know you're gonna give me creds <laughs> forgot about that yeah and uh yeah it, it, it's it's amazing um after i had covid the second time i had covid mm. i lost a percentage of my hearing in certain frequencies in fact i had to go to sit a lot of times not hearing much Whoa. Uh, because I, I got an autoimmune disease after COVID, psoriasis, mm. and I got it in my nose and my ear canal. So the skin would grow over the eardrum in my ear canal. I wouldn't be what? able to hear. I had to do my best to lip read what other actors were saying and then give a performance, let alone feeling completely out of depth with, your, with yourself. You know, yeah. your depth perception is off, not knowing how to gauge. Am I talking loud enough? Because mm, you're voice. not hearing yourself. Yeah, you're not feeling it. You're not <laughs> hearing yourself, you know, and then having to dig deep to trust yourself and what it is that you're doing on a deeper huh. level, but still committing. Um, right after that uh, dark cloud lifted a little bit, I had the opportunity to go back into studio and I recorded a single this year called Hold On To Love. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> it was more from a point of celebrating the fact that I do have life, that I have this gift, that I have this ability. And also it no longer became about needing to prove to people that I'm a musician, that I'm a mm. multi-instrumentalist, mm. a singer-songwriter. All of that, those things don't were matter. gone for me. Don't matter for me. For me, it was like, but what do I want people to experience when they listen to the song? What do I want the song to do mm. for them, mm. not for me? Huh. You know? And that's the great thing about, um, you know, evolution and growth. It's just its own reward. And I'm happy that things turn out the way that they turn out because I'm thinking to myself, what would have happened if at the peak of my TV fame, if mm. I can call it that, you know, when I would say maybe I had the most, the biggest viewership mm -hmm. at that point in time, what would have happened if my music was equally or even not bigger than that? I probably would have destroyed myself. Yeah. Why would you say that though? Because... I think all of us think we know ourselves well enough until you find yourself in an environment where the underdeveloped areas of yourself now takes over. Mm -hmm, mm, you know, mm. we see it happen to many artists, you know. And also, I think the thing that might be a little bit difficult to understand, even for a lot of artists, if they don't have awareness, and this is where I feel like I, my approach is slightly different to what other artists do, mm. right? Um, Firstly, you need to know what your price is before you enter the door. Mm -hmm. If you don't know how much it's going to cost mm. to buy you. What's your, what's your worth? 
what's if you don't know what it's going to cost, yeah. right? Then you're you're headed for trouble. It's either going to be sex mm. or it's power or it's money. Mm. You know, usually for guys. And then we and because what what it is that you have to do as an artist as an actor, as a singer, a lot of the stuff has to do with emoting, feeling emotions, mm -hmm. also a sensory experience. Yeah. So if you're constantly bombarding your nervous system and your brain and your psyche, your psychology with, with these sensory experiences, if you don't have sufficient awareness, you will then, you can lead yourself into a space where you even, uh, your underdeveloped self will, will then take center stage. Yeah. And what, you'll what, learn what through mistakes. What when, happens when that takes center stage? What, what, because it sounds like... The you, ego. Yeah. Yeah. Egoism. Ego yeah. takes over. Ego Jeez. takes over. Yeah. And um, I've seen it with people who are super, super talented. Still today, if they get the right amount of attention, it changes them. You're like, but don't you have 20 odd years experience in this thing? But that's how potent the fame drug is. Jeez. That's how potent it, potent it is. You see, you see uh, leaders of countries, mm -hmm. you see pastors, all of those people with high positions, leadership positions, still fall victim to what fame can bring to your doorstep and what it can do to you. you know? mm -hmm. So therefore, I never ever wanted, I think I was scared of crossing that threshold and believing that, yeah, I am the ish. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I am yeah. that I am that dude that everyone's talking about. I am that guy that doesn't need three takes to get to get it in the can. I am that guy that never has to take scripts home mm. and learn like other actors do. I do it three minutes, two minutes, 30 seconds before I do my scene. And my intention and my instinct is spot on. Yeah, I am that guy. I never wanted to believe that. Mm. Be but wh why is it that you, you stayed away from that belief? Because... One can easily argue that there's some positive that comes with that because not all is, is necessarily negative. It's how yeah. you use the fame. Yeah. yeah, You know, you can use it for positive, you can use it for negative. But why is it that you never jumped that threshold of, of staying, staying sane, so to speak? I don't know. I've just never been a fan of overselling and under-delivering. Okay. Yeah. I've always been the, the guy that, you know, I'll... I'll undersell and over-deliver. Mm, mm. um, also, because I feel like there is a certain amount of danger with um, the self-guard. Mm. <laughs> you know, we, we become slaves to the self-guard easily. You know, yeah. everyone's talking about believe in yourself and just yourself and you got to do it yourself. And mm. I mean, if we if we have to do everything ourselves, I, I I I challenge people and ask them, when was the last time that you counted how many beats your heart needs to beat for you to be alive? Mm. When was the last time that you dispersed all of the blood that comes from that pumping heart to the rest of the, your body? When is the last time that you were in control of every single nerve in your nervous system? Mm. When was the last time that you were able? to construct your life and design your life in such a way that when you went to sleep, it continues the exact same way that you left it. You had no participation in that mm. whatsoever. Mm. You were gone. You were not even here. But still we wake up favored and we have that. We didn't even have to earn a body. You just got this great, <laughs> you know, technology and it does all of these things. And that's why people neglect it because they've ne they don't know what it is to, mm. they don't know the value of it. They didn't have to earn it. Mm. So I think for me, I looked at even the strongest people and I heard their conversations and people that have achieved great things in this industry, but behind closed doors, the types of conversations that they were having, I'm like, okay, so on the outside, people respect you as a businessman and respect you as all of you because your success looks great to them, but on the inside, mm -hmm. your character is rotten. Yeah. And that, You're a rotten individual, man. And that happens, eh? There's a lot it's, of that. There's a lot of that. Yeah. And I didn't want that because I didn't want to be associated with that type of care. I, I, I felt like the true measure of, of, of a man is to be able to withstand all of these things, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, I've had my fair share of troubles. I've had my fair share of misusing my influence to my own benefit mm -hmm. as a young man as a young person in the industry is discovering yourself and having no mentorship. And mm. I've learned a lot more through my mistakes than, than anything else. My mistakes were my mentors. Let's go to a time when you, you got auditioned now. 
uh, because you, getting into acting wasn't necessarily easy for you. You yeah. you you went to school. You studied this thing. Yeah. Uh, with great ambition, parents supported this. I imagine. To a degree, yeah. <laughs> Why do you say to a degree? <laughs> to a degree, they did because I think for every parent it was like, but uh, actors they poor people. Oh, so that's you know that, you know, that was their perspective. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Before my grandfather passed away, he passed away. I think the day before my first episode on backstage was about to Whoa. air, right? Yeah. Uh, on my mom's birthday. And uh, he called me into the bedroom and he was like, so Clint, your mom tells me that you're doing this acting thing. Mm. I said, yes, Papa. He said, oh, they're going to pay you. <laughs> I said, ah, well, you know, they're paying me this amount. And I mean, I'm 19 years old at that point in time. He was, um, worked in construction. Okay. You know, manual labor. Yeah. Yeah. Do yeah. things with your hands. Absolutely. What's the standing on the stage pretending to be <laughs> someone else? What is this, you know? Yeah. And I told him what my first paycheck was going to be. And his eyes just popped out like that. He said, what? Was it more than he expected? Yeah, I think it was way more than he expected for a 19-year-old kid in a field where, you know. And I told him, I said, this is what they were going to pay me. Mm. And he was like, oh. Okay. He goes, okay, well... um do this acting thing but when you're done get a real job oh. you know afterwards <laughs> so I mean a, a, a lot of where we come from you know that's still the mindset because they haven't really seen actors either for a long time being able to take care of themselves mm. put the kids through school buy a house have mm. property have a business have medical aid have life insurance yeah. and do that over a period of time where it benefits the family structure did, did mommy and daddy uh Agree with it though, with the career? They were just like, you better make this thing work. Mm, well, <laughs> you better make this thing work, man. You, <laughs> you know, want yeah, it? Yeah, listen, we invested a lot in you for you to do this thing. Yeah. And um, so there was a combination of letting me know realistically what it's like to go out there and fend for yourself. Mm. And then also saying, hey, you made this decision, right? We're going to support you but you're going to have to put some real work behind this for you to get somewhere and we'll keep on supporting you. Yeah. And that's exactly what they Make did. It work. And um, yeah. I guess it, it did. 23, but, yeah. 23 years of consistency, 23 years of consistent contribution in the South African entertainment industry. I'm super proud of myself. And I didn't have to sell my soul to get it. I didn't have to compromise on my integrity mm -hmm. as a human being to get there. You know, yeah. I didn't have to play a game. Listen, I can't go out there and act in my personal capacity, I'm going to have to invoice people for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, there has to be an invoice. There has to be an invoice. I've got to go out there and, uh, you know, act in, in, in my real life. No, man, I already do it. It's my job. <laughs> yes. Tell me, though, about the first gig. It's an interesting story, how yeah. you get your first gig. Actually, it's probably amongst your first auditions. You, are, you had studied at the stage. Yes. You were qualified. Yes. But you're not, you don't have a, a job. This I is. Yeah, no job. What happens? There's an interesting story about how you got your first audition. No, hey, man, like no job. And uh, my dad was, at that time, was selling insurance, right? Mm. <clears throat> and I was sitting at home two months after uh, I graduated and, you know, uh, received my certification. And uh, you're he, just hanging around the house. You're I'm not hanging working. around the house. Yeah, no, I'm working at Pick and Pay. Oh, okay. You know, okay. I had a couple of odd jobs here Please. and there Pick and Pay, Truards, mm. worked in the butchery. Okay. Uh, you know, <laughs> um, worked at a newspaper factory, night shift, you know, overalls, okay. like I did that. Yes. Um, and uh, he told me, he Slaches. said, you Slaches, were, yes. boss. I was that guy, listen, Christmas Day in the Slaches is tough. Especially <laughs> if you're the new guy. You did that. I did that, boss. Stock take and those doors open, you know, a new guy. Jeez. Stock take, you got to go move those cows and mm. weigh them. Mm. I worked at a butchery. That's why I, I, I know the experience. Yes. It's a cold experience. It's a cold experience. <laughs> Look, and making sausage was not my favorite. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, my dad was like, so you've been at home for about two months now? Obviously saying that, you know, meaning mm. that you, mm. so you got this accreditation. What are you going to do with it? What's going on? Yeah. yeah. I said, well, I don't know, man. They taught me how to do this thing. They never taught us how to go out there and actually get a job for oh, it. Oh, hell. <laughs> so he goes, okay, okay. There's something missing. There's something missing. In the missing. teaching? Yeah. Definitely. And I think a lot of young actors will still be able to tell you that that's exactly, you know, there's that component 
you don't they don't teach you that maybe mm. the curriculums have changed now i don't know yeah uh, how to structure and understand the business of the entertainment industry mm. um, but they are a lot more focused on developing talent mm. so pops was like you've been at home two months you have till next week if you don't have anything you're going to sell insurance for me i yeah. was like l no <laughs> guys a slave driver i'm not going to manage here you didn't want to work for him. I didn't want to work for my dad. No, yeah. no, that was going to be a tough job for me. He's a <laughs> tough customer. Yes. <laughs> I didn't even know why. I just opened up the newspaper. I went through the newspaper and then it's just this. <laughs> now you were actively looking. Now for I'm work. actively looking. I got a week. That's not enough time. Yeah. And I uh, opened the newspaper and there was this article that said gangs and dances, uh, feature film audition. And it said, uh, book up, you know. Okay, what is book up? Book up in Cape Town. <laughs> oh, yeah, in okay. Cape Town. That's yes. where, yeah, that's where they were having the yeah. audition. So next day, Saturday morning, I'm on a train on my way through to Cape Town from Paul. Mm. On the train for about hour and a half, two hours to get there. I get to the audition room. It's filled with all of these models. Now, look, Cape Town is known for that. Of course. The guys look. Mm. great the mm. women are beautiful you know aesthetically the scenery the mountain yeah. the ocean you know just adds to this vibe there's always a, there's also a time called season yeah definitely yeah, where, where all the models are around the world all of the models uh, around the world are yeah. in Cape Town looking for work and now here I am a Paul Boyke I don't particularly look like anything great. I'm just, mm. you know. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I'm talking to some of the the people in, in, and I'm seeing what the vibe is like there in the audition room. So the dude next to me mm. was a model, abs out, <laughs> sitting there talking to all of the girls. And uh, the receptionist says, who here don't have managers? Mm -hmm. And, oh, agents. Agents, yeah. yes. So yes. as I wanted to put up my hand, she goes, we're not seeing any of you. If you don't have representation, we are not seeing You're you You're wasting today. your time. I'm like, I can't. So go. you didn't raise that no, hand. No, I was like, you, okay. <laughs> I couldn't. Yeah. I was like, I'm going to go back home. Insurance, bro. <laughs> it's amazing. The, the reason your career worked, because you didn't want to work for your dad. <laughs> I didn't want to work for my dad, right? So, um, this guy, while he was talking to some of the models, mm. he looked around and chatted up some girls and I just checked his form out and I was like, Janet wrote down her telephone number, the agent's name. Oh, so you looked at his forms, yeah, wrote just, what he wrote. Just so I can go get and do the audition. I just needed to get into the door. Done. I was like, I, needed to, I need to find out real life what I'm worth mm, on paper, mm. right? I mean, in university, I had, look, actually my entire schooling career, I've been blessed. Mm. I built up a name for myself uh, regionally. Yeah. My uh, accreditation went from 80%, 85%, 90, 95, 99%, 99 plus percent. As, a, as an actor or as, musician? As an actor and a yeah. musician wow. in the I. Stedford yes, from, yes. from being a kid. And then I competed in the Dalro National Acting Competition when mm. I was in Standard 7. Ended up in the top 10. I'm from an ordinary co-ed school. Mm. I competed against all of the, like nationally against all of the art school kids. I ended up in the top 10. Two years later, I, I competed again. Mm. I ended up second. Where wow. One of the judges stood up after they declared the winner and they said, we know that, and he told the other judges, he said, you know that that Brink kid was supposed to win, but because that kid's dad is a big contributor to this. And that was also my first experience of what the entertainment of reality. industry is. Of reality. Yeah. You know? And he said, I, I, won't, I won't have any part in this. And he left. What? <laughs> the, so, you, so you knew you won. Yeah, then and I knew. I, then I knew. Yeah. Oh, so I actually won this thing then? Ugh. You know, kind of. <laughs> they came to me afterwards and said, look here, we still would like to offer you a three-year free scholarship at Pretoria Tech. Mm -hmm. And um, being the stubborn kid that I was, I was like, I'm no one's second best. I earned my spot. Yeah. If you don't publicly want to acknowledge me, I'm not going to have you privately Tell me, away, that, tell I'm the me that I'm good enough. Yeah. No, then I'll go out and work for it myself. Oh, no, look, at, look at the politician in oh, you. Oh my goodness, man. I should have just <laughs> Your mom's shut up. politician spirit. <laughs> she was probably like, ah, could this guy just like, you know. <laughs> this is how the world works. <laughs> this is how the world works. Yes. Yeah, well, welcome. <laughs> so you knew, even at this stage of this audition, that you had a lot of cred. Definitely. I yeah. had weight behind me. I had yes. momentum behind yeah. me, for sure. And I believe that I also got to the point where I, I realized that when you, and it's the same thing I would, I would say now that it's the same thing that I apply to weight training and weight training taught me the same thing. Mm. 
Mm. When you load up heavy weight, right? The thing that makes you survive each rep is mm. the fact that you are responsible enough to handle the load, mm -hmm. which means as, as soon as you take the handbrake off that weight, you have to be completely confident in your movement because mm -hmm. if you doubt yourself, you'll hurt yourself. True. Yeah. So when I go on set, yes, I am the best. Yeah. And you know this. This is, well, yeah. this is how I go out there and have presence. This is where I pull all of that strength from and I go, okay, let it come out the way that it needs to come out, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I, I definitely had strong self-belief when it came to that. So I went into the audition process. Mm -hmm. It was a group audition. It was improv. They choose one guy to be the gang leader talking to the other guys and then, you know, Sabella Damani, Owen Sani, Anakant, you know yeah. what I mean? Fake agent, <laughs> but it's okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so the director stops me when it was my turn to audition and he says, you are great. You're brilliant. What's mm. your name, young man? I mm. said, Clint Brink, sir. Mm. He goes, where are you from? I said, Paul. He goes, who's your agent? I'm like, um, Janet. <laughs> he goes, Janet Duplessis? I'm like, yeah. He goes, that's a really good friend of mine. Mm. And he takes out his flip phone then and he calls Jan and I'm How are you like, feeling at this stage? <laughs> Listen, like I'm soiling my underwear, boss. <laughs> <laughs> it's my heart's like Whoa. this. <laughs> he calls, he says, Janet, I love this kid. He is brilliant. I want him for the lead in this feature film. She goes, yeah? He goes, yeah. Uh, what's your name again? Clint, Clint Brink, yeah. Oh, Janet wants to speak to you. <laughs> And he hands me the phone in front of all of these guys, you know, all of these actors, these hopefuls in this room. Ugh. And um, she had a couple of choice words. Of course. Yeah, not happy with the fact that I used her name, her reputation, her brand mm. without her permission. She was like, you better, how are you arrogant? Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> you better, how dare you do this? You have some balls on you, man, man. I want to see you in my office tomorrow. I said, yes, Janet, everything went well. Thank you so much. Love you too. See you tomorrow. Bye. <laughs> Next day, oh, I had a, this is a crazy story. Next man. day, I had a drive through to Cape Town to go see Janet. To go for see the best Janet. Time. My dad's driving me. He was like, "What the hell were you thinking?" I'm like, "Hey, insurance got me panicking. <laughs> I had to do something." And he checked me out like this. <laughs> so I went and I met Janet, yeah. and uh, she told me, "I need headshots from you." And listen, I just wanted so, to. So, let so, you. so Janet was now okay because you're getting a job. I'm getting a job. I went yeah. in there, and she said, "You know what you did there, right? Take some stones mm. to do what you did." Are you as good as you think you are? And I said, Janet, I think I'm as good as I think I am. Mm -hmm. yeah, I am. So you she forced goes, okay. yourself on an agent, basically. After, yeah, <laughs> hard. <laughs> um, she said, okay, well, if that's the case, there's an audition, an audition tomorrow I would like you to go for. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, they've, they've closed the audition process for about a week, but I think there's one role that they haven't casted yet. And I think you might, if you're good, mm -hmm. like you say you are, mm -hmm. you might get this role. That's that's the backstage. That was the edition. role that I auditioned for for backstage, and out of seven hundred hopefuls, for my role alone, I I was chosen, and that kickstarted my career twenty three years ago. Did you get the job the the one that you faked your age? Did that ever? The happen? film never got yes. funding. Oh, bummer! But it still worked. It cut, your life still worked. My life still worked. It catapulted me. It was there. It was a door. It was a platform, a springboard for me to take me to where I needed to be. It was all, if we were to get all spiritual on this, it was all created for you. That entire created. moment. But this is Funding the, or no funding. <laughs> this is the beautiful thing about, I think, all of our lives individually. If we have to, without looking at everyone else's life and go back and really dissect and crunch the numbers and you look at the miracle of what our own lives are, we'll be able to trace that there were many moments, one significant moment that led you to another moment that might have felt insignificant, but was the perfect, it was the perfect moment to have you be the perfect temperature to be accepted to go into the next phase That's of true. your life, you know? That is true. So yeah, I feel more than blessed. Mm. I feel more than privileged because I know that there are many other people who are super talented, who yeah. are super hungry out there, who don't get those opportunities, you know, and they are sitting there hopeless and in despair. And I'm here to let people know that, you know, you just keep on mm. working, keep on working, keep on believing, keep on building it the way that you need to build it to ensure your success and that you don't die inside, you know? Yeah. And you don't die inside with all of your dreams still locked up on the inside. Mm. I think that is the biggest tragedy of life.
So, um, yeah. yeah, man, I'm Keep blessed. Keep going. Sean Jake Jacobs, that's the character you yes. played. Uh, how early into the show was uh, Sean uh, casted? As in, was the show old already or it had, it was the beginning of the The beginning backstage? of the show. I think the third episode, I was in the third episode of the show. <laughs> that's when I aired. Yeah, I was one of the... The Ellie characters. Yeah, one of the founding characters. Pretty yeah, much, yeah. 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 You were yes. like uh, Rich Foster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, without the jawline. <laughs> one of the early guys in the show. Yeah, I was one of the early guys in the show. Nine, ten years old. Yeah. yeah. And, and the casting for that role, was it a tricky casting? Now that you had an agent. <laughs> well, I mean, this was the first audition that she sent me to. Mm. And I remember I had to go to Sasani Studios at the waterfront. Yeah. Uh, I went in there in this warehouse, this abandoned warehouse. And there was this old white guy behind the camera. Mm. Uh, and that white guy was and is Gray Hoffmeyer. Whoa. You know, yeah, you the know, great Gray Hoffmeyer. Great Gray Hoffmeyer, yeah. you know. The guy behind uh, uh, Pissidingo. Pissidingo, Leon Schuster's work. 100%. Yeah. You know, we, we know him to be the giant that he is. And um, I had to do my backstage audition. And in this audition, I had to kiss someone. And all I see is Gray Hoffmeyer behind this camera. <laughs> and I'm like, do I have to commit and kind of like lean in and try and kiss this dude? What am I going to do? I'm like, hey, you want this job. You better do whatever you need to do to get this job. Mm, <clears throat> um, and just before we got to the kiss, he was like, no, it's fine. We don't have to do that. Thank mm, you. You don't have to do that. Yeah, uh, thank you. Mm. So I left there and my dad was standing outside smoking. He was like, how did you do? And I'm like, I, I think that was probably the worst audition that I've done in what? my life. Were you the only one I was on the, the only day? One. No one else? They were not waiting for Listen, anybody There wasn't else. even a car in the parking lot. Jeez. So the feeling that I got was like, why am I sent here in this abandoned, to this abandoned place, right? Mm. The next day I get a phone call saying, uh, Mr. Vundla would like to see you on Sunday. You need to come to the castle. I'm like, who's Mr. Vundla? Mm. The castle, please, Mr. Brink, Sunday. Just, uh, just, oh, just rock up. Yeah, okay, cool. Me and my mom and my sister and my dad in the car from Paul drive all the way to the castle. Uh, so there was a lot of commuting. There was a lot of commuting, yeah, yeah for <laughs> sure. Uh, and we get there and they open the doors and then I just see all of this lights, all of these lights moving and, you know, cameras. It's a and set. Tracks and yeah, it's a set. I'm like, whoa. Jeez. And this dude with the headset comes to me and goes, hi, hi, um, but what are you guys doing here? And I said, uh, Mr. Vundler, uh, said I needed to be here. They said, are you Sean? Mm. I said, what? I said, no, I'm, I'm Clint. I'm Clint. <laughs> they said, yeah, but are you Sean? I said, I don't know. Mr. Vundler said, okay, never mind. Just walk this way. And they took me to the craft, uh, to the green room. They said, this is the green room. There's a craft table. And I was like, yo, man, these people have snacks and free coffee mm -hmm. and whatever. They're like, have whatever you want and um, uh, we'll come fetch you when Mr. Vundler is ready. I'm like, 100%. Okay. Guy comes back, he goes, Sean, I said, listen, I'm here to see. They said, just come with me. Cool. <laughs> And I you were up, Sean before you knew you were Sean. You know, and I walked up the stairs and they were busy shooting the title sequence of Backstage there with the dancers, Whoa. right? And it just looked so epic. And there was Mfundi Vundla and he turned around and he greeted my family, my parents. And he said, young man, out of 684 people that auditioned for your role alone, I'm choosing you. Your agent doesn't even know that I'm choosing you. What? I think that you're going to be a star. Yeah. And that's what he told me. He said, so I would like to let you know firsthand that you got the part. Mm. This is going to be one of the biggest shows in this country. Jeez. I didn't know what that meant, you know? You didn't obviously know, know what this entire journey was. This backstage thing that's yeah. happening, which channel it was going to play on. <laughs> 100%. Yeah. And um, that's, where, that's where it all started for me. Jeez. And I'm I'm really really super grateful. If, wow. if 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 I have to take a look at it, I'm like, it's like the things that you know fairy tales are made of. Fundi <laughs> Fundler saying you'll be all right. Yeah, we we like you. Yeah, and I think um I have a lot of respect for Mfundi. Yeah. I also have a lot of respect for the fact that uh, he said he told me from a young age, even like um you know after uh, after the car accident that I was in, mm. and he told me he said you know what man. You're going to be stuck. You will never be without work. Mm, wow. And he, he said that, and I took that as a blessing on my life. And till today, mm. I've never been without work in the entertainment industry. That's incredible. That is incredible. Do you know how, how rare that statement is? Definitely. On that chair. 
Because yes. I've had many people sit on that chair. Yeah. And they say there are times where there's nothing. Yeah, look, even in the times where it was, and and literally, I had a short experience of needing to needing to go freelance. Mm, it mm. was between 2014 and 2015. Yeah. And because, you know, the music thing kept me afloat, I was doing lots of corporates. Okay. I was yeah. playing at the, you know, uh, for the Man Mandela family, mm, mm. you know, doing gigs and events and stuff like that. So I would be taken from one thing into another thing and be carried and, you know, get other experiences and then building up my experience as mm. a musician in that space, which I found also, you know, invaluable. So I was always, and this is why I'm so grateful for my life right now. Yeah. I'm, I'm really grateful if I have to take a look at it. Even when I couldn't do much for myself, mm. somehow I've always been favored. Somehow I've always been moved to the front of the queue, even if I couldn't do it by my own mm -hmm. efforts. Yeah. You know? It just always worked. It just always worked. And I attribute that to every teacher, to every family member, to my mom being on her knees, praying for me still today. You know, people wishing me well. The, the handful of people that I know that really believed in me and that still do believe in me mm. and that helped instill the balance, I think, the balance that I have. Here's the yeah. other thing. I mean, you asked me earlier, why did I never want to believe the hype about myself? Mm. I can tell you now, man, I've met a lot of super talented people in this country who believe their own hype. And you know what it does? It just corrupts their character. Mm. People would say, wow, yeah, great artist, millions of followers, super famous. What a shit individual to Ooh. be around. And I'm sorry to say it like that. Ooh. No respect. That happens, eh? No respect. Arrives late. Treats people horribly. I never want to work with this person again. Mm. And I'm like, I don't want that. Mm -mm. What happens when I have kids? My kids have to grow up knowing that there's this double life that this dad is, that dad's living. You know, on the one end, he's this great guy. At home, he's probably a cool guy. Mm. But there's this ego about him and this this level of, you know, looking down on other people mm. because I've been able to elevate myself to a degree where my interaction and my experience of life is not what the ordinary You think is. you're better. You're better, you know. Yeah. And I, my mom beat that out of me as a kid. <laughs> you no, know, you're better than no one. Yeah. Okay. You, know, yes. you respect that guy that cleans your bathroom first thing in the morning. When you go to school, you re that's your uncle. That's someone that is a grown man that's providing for their family. You mm -hmm. respect that man mm -hmm. because you can also be and you need to have respect for what it is that you're doing as well. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I grew up with that mindset and I never, I always felt like the quality of my work and what it is that I'm able to deliver should propel me. True. It should be measured by that. It should be measured by that. Yeah. Now I find myself in a very different uh, uh, state mm -hmm. of being and experience of life where, you know, we see that that, that is no longer the case mm -mm. <laughs> with a lot of things. Yeah. It's not the talent. No, it's not the talent. Definitely not the talent these days, you know. Yeah. It's funny. I mean, uh, a lot of people talk about it. I mean, you can go into the socials X. I'm still getting used to calling it I'm, X. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm like you, man. It's still Twitter, Twitter to me. me yeah. It'll stay like that for a while. I take long to transition anyway. <laughs> so, me too. Yeah, I'll, I'll get there. <laughs> so, I mean, I've, uh, we see this, this word legend being used mm, a lot. Very loosely. You know, legend, legend. Mm. And I'm like... <laughs> there are people who are true legends of the crafts in our country. Yeah. How come they're not working? How true. come the people who have won the most awards that everyone is saying, these are the most talented actors and musicians, these are the most talented people, we craftsmen in the entertainment industry, mm -hmm. but they're not working. Mm -hmm. That makes, that's like... Something's wrong there. It's super ironic. So yeah. if the best isn't working, then who is working? Mm. <laughs> What's your answer? You know, well, I, I think I think it's the most marketable who's working right now. Yeah. Because we have, I think, in the entertainment business, we have steered away from creating art. We don't want people to wake up. We have we have found out now that keeping them asleep and feeding them their their uh, 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 their uh, addictive habits, you know, mm. just feeding that habit and keeping them as patients. <laughs> You're talking about audience, yeah. Talking right? about yeah. audience, yeah. yeah. You know, we want to keep you in that position 
So it just perpetuates whatever it is we're doing. We're not trying to enlighten you really. There's a small percentage of people mm. who are interested in that. Mm. Mm. But if we can keep you here, we are able to make sure that we can guarantee some form of return of our investment. Des- describe it easily for us. Uh, the what, entertainment what, what, industry. What you're describing. Yeah, what you're telling. I would say the entertainment yeah. industry is no longer run by creatives and artists. It's run by lawyers and accountants. Ah. Uh. Uh, Everything is about numbers now. Mm. Everything. And I get it, man. I mean, the entertainment business, business. it's a business. It's also difficult to invest in a business where, you know, there are so many things that you need to work around. Mm -hmm. Variables, right? So a lot of people are just trying to make sure that they get the return on investment. But in so doing, the application of wanting to ensure that they get good return on investment, they have Mm. to now sacrifice on other things. And that means, I mean... If we take a look at it right now, we've all been grouped by ethnicity. Mm-hmm. That's an apartheid legacy we carry. You know, but also now in the entertainment business, that's what's happening because okay. South Africa is so diverse as a country. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not like the States where we only have two languages mm-hmm. and a lot of people can consume whatever content we put in in those two languages. We mm-hmm. have 11 official languages. Mm-hmm. I think we have 14 different types of people yeah. living in this country, right? And, uh, demographics are real Mm. and they are needs people need to be catered to. I mean, if your home language is Tswana, why Mm. would you want to go watch an Afrikaans show? You would ask yourself that question. You know what I mean? You would rather want something that's a lot more relatable to your life and you'll be be able to connect with the characters, the stories and the environment, right? Mm. So what has happened now is that if you are Afrikaans speaking, it doesn't matter, you know, what color you are. Mm. You've been put on the Afrikaans box. Zulu people have been put in the Zulu box. There's that content, there's that content, mm. right? Which I also feel is beneficial to the entertainment business because now we are seeing that, I think, um, I spoke with someone and they said South Africa actually the second biggest industry to contribute to the GDP of South Africa is the entertainment business. It's crazy. Yeah. But those numbers never get released. We don't actually know the, the value contribu- of that contribution. The value of the entertainment yeah. business in South yeah. Africa. We don't yeah. know. So um, what has happened now is that uh, for me being classified as mm-hmm. a colored guy, mm-hmm. right? Off the bat, when you look at me, a lot of people were like, well, is this guy really a colored guy? Like, it's really difficult to place him. <laughs> well, but, what would, why would they question that? A pale skinned, yeah, you know, yeah. I don't have the heavy colored accent. I mean, mm. I can switch it up. Yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, when uh, <laughs> when, when it's when necessary. When it's necessary, you know. Yeah. Um, but also, there is this image, and this is the thing that's really scary for me about the entertainment industry right now. Right, mm. is that remember, most of us. I wanted to become an actor, and be on TV after I was able to see visuals and images on TV. Mm -hmm. If I never saw those visuals, I would never have had that dream because that would not have been possible for me. It doesn't exist, Mm -hmm. right? So right now, I am concerned about the fact where the image that's being put out Mm -hmm. of brown, and I'm going to go with males Mm -hmm. predominantly in this country, in the entertainment business is not necessarily put in a aspirational, affluent uh, setup. Mm, true. I get that. You know, we kind of like perpetuate the same things. We're the drug dealers. You know, mm. we're the guys in prison. We are the guys with the shady characters. You're a lawyer, but you're a dirty cop or whatever. Mm, you know, there's mm, those things. Mm. And um, I have to be honest with you also. I, from the beginning of my career, I set out to change all of those things because I never had to be that. Mm. Never, you well, never had to, but you've played those characters at some I played, point. I yeah. play, I've dabbled here, I've touched mm. here, I've touched there. Yeah. But I've never played the stereotypical mm. um, gangster mm. or drug dealer or whatever. It's never been like that because yeah. my intentions in the entertainment industry were like, but what, what about those guys sitting in Lavender Hill? What about those guys sitting in Chicago? They're mm. in Park. Mm. You know, what about mm. the boys there in Hanover Park? Yeah. You know, if we don't give them a visual that is, other than to that their reality, is, you know, is. what do they really have to dream about and, mm. and, and dream for? So um, I, uh, 
I digress to, to connect with what we were saying earlier is that because we've been gripped grouped by ethnicity, which, uh, you know, makes business sense. We have now kind of like forfeited what art was really supposed to be about. And mm. the great uh, playwright and director, Sanford Meisner, I said it when I won this after for, in 2021 for Best Actor in a Soap. Yeah. I quoted Sanford Meisner and Sanford Meisner said, acting was never supposed to be about fame and fortune. Because acting is like a religious calling because you have been given the opportunity and the responsibility to inspire humanity. Yeah. Through art, we break down walls. Through art, we are supposed to diminish ego, not enforce not, it, yeah. reinforce or not, it. Or, or not, not create it. Even. And, not, and not create it, you know. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. we're at this stage now where people don't know what the difference is between what is real and what is not. Mm. Everything looks the same. Jeez. In fact, people prefer the fake because it's an escapism. It's a form of escapism. You know, mm -hmm. it takes them out mm -hmm. of whatever life it is that they are experiencing currently right now. And when you give them something real, it's a little bit too hard to digest. It's a little yeah. bit too much. Jeez. And sometimes it's a little bit too boring. Well, that's true. And we do exist in a time when doing boring is a business risk. <laughs> it's a business risk. Because you have to you know, use up the stuff even bigger than they're supposed Theatrics. to be. That's what it is. Theatrics. You know, <laughs> yes. we take a look at the news, bad news sells more covers. Naturally. You know, or like, uh, yeah, bad news on yes. covers sells more newspapers than good news. Yeah. No one wants to hear about people doing good. They want to hear about the bad stuff that's happening in the world, you know. Mm, it's far more entertaining. It's far more entertaining. <laughs> yeah. Right? That's so crazy. Yeah. Let's go back to the time now with, with uh, Backstage because that's a big moment in your career. You, you step into this role. Do you enjoy this? What is the experience now? Because remember, for the longest time you aspired. Yeah. And now you're in it. Yes. It Does it live up to expectation? Yeah, it definitely did yeah. in the beginning. I, I think I was fortunate to be on a new show. That's true. Uh, complete, Everybody knew. <laughs> yes. Most you know, people probably knew to the game as well. Yes. And it's uh, it was revolutionary. You know, uh, it changed the way that we approach soapies, the way that sets were lit. Mm. You know, the lighting was was new. Mm. The sets were different. The story was different. You now have a mixture of all of these different types of people and they are young and they are, you know, aspiring to be someone one day, you know, yeah. uh, a show about hopes and dreams and talent and the lives of young people. I mean, it was the perfect plot. It was the perfect uh, mm. platform for great stories. And um, here I am mm. in the mix of all of this. It definitely lived up to to yeah. my expectations. Yeah. yeah. It's an interesting storyline if you think about it, because it was talking about dreams and aspirations. And yet almost everyone on 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 that on that cast yeah. had that same feeling of dreams and aspirations. hundred percent. Yes. It was a story that that almost reflected reality. And I think maybe that was what they were looking for in each individual. They yeah. wanted to see in their eyes that this is someone that still wants to be someone. Because that needs to be at the base you mm, know, of mm. who the characters, all the characters need to be. They didn't want to have someone walk in there feeling that they're already established. They're the dude, you know, I'm yeah. the girl or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they really succeeded in that. It, it became a big show. A massive show. <laughs> a big stage was a, humongous. A, a, a massive show. I, I, because of that, I mean, after that, I went to the biggest show in the country, Generations. That's it, Generations, yeah. And then after that, to another big show, Scandal. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, you know, that got me, that gave me an opportunity to do exactly what I set out to do, yeah. which was play someone that is affluent, mm. someone that is aspirational, someone that is not the stereotype. And that time, I mean, um, I'll be very honest with you, the reason why I had to leave Generations, when mm. I looked at the trajectory of my character, Mm. And one day I sat down and I got really angry when I thought about it. I was like, the character was written, uh, Bradley Pulser. Mm. I was introduced to the show. He just came out of prison. Yeah. He was a misunderstood guy. He had dyslexia. So, you know, I had a problem reading and writing. He ended up working behind the bar with Sonny, right? He found out that Anne de Villiers was his mom and his mom was actually a pimp and a prostitute at a certain point in time. Okay. And one day, I stood still and I looked at all of these things and I, and I was really heartbroken because I realized that I was being used and my character was actually what a lot of, was what South Africans saw 
the worst that they saw in colored people. Mm -hmm. This guy came out of jail. Yeah. We are troublemakers, you know. Mm. This guy's got dyslexia, so we are illiterate, we mm. are ignorant, we mm. can't read or we can't write. He works in the bar, colored people, booze, mm. we know how it goes. And his mom was a prostitute. And there are people who still perpetuate the belief that, you know, most colored peoples, we are bastards, really. Mm -hmm. You know, mm. we are, we don't have a tribe, we don't really belong, mm. uh, whatever. And I looked at that and I'm like, I can no longer support this. Mm. I can no longer support this way of thinking. Even if it's packaged nicely and that, you know, they put a nice it's ribbon glossy. on it. No, it's not that bad, you know. Yeah, it was that it's, bad it's for me. It's on generations. <laughs> it's, you know, it was that bad for me. Yeah. And um, it meant that I was contributing to the misinformation of people. Mm -hmm. People being misinformed and also people, my people being mismanaged. And when I say my people, I say that loosely because mm, everyone mm. in South Africa is my cool. people. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so when I went to Scandal, I had the opportunity to play someone who's a property developer who is educated, mm. um, you know, who is moneyed, who can change people's lives. True. And he's the hero. Mm. I'm like, yeah. This is the one. <laughs> yeah, this is, I have an opportunity to change mindsets because I understood the the power of of visuals, yeah. you know, what it does, of having that picture of visualization. Yeah. So. Jeez. You know, what you've said now takes us to a number of, of places about the colored, the colored community in yes. South Africa. It's a tricky space and I don't expect you to be an expert in it. Interesting, yeah. there's a book that's just been written recently called Colored. Yeah. Exactly that. It's written by two journalists who are doing research, really. It's a research piece on the history and so forth and so forth, trying to understand uh, the place of the colored community in yes. the South African context because it's such a complex place. Yes. And if you may have noticed in the in recent times on social media, there's been a debate about uh, racist colors and all of that. Yes. It's been a, a, a something that we've been clearly debating on social spaces yes, for a yes. while. And I'll, I'll be the first to tell you that the first time I was ever called a kafir by, was by colored people, mm. uh, not not by by a white man. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, there's always a, this this little place. What is your your take about the colored community in South Africa and how they are portrayed and, and how they really fit? And I use the word they very carefully here. Uh, so yes, it's, yes. I distinguish between uh, that and everybody else. Yeah, what is yeah. your take on this very complex complex yeah i think you know it's it, it's so tough because uh, different people will have different experiences of course. and i think at different stages in your upbringing and your life you will have also different experiences mm -hmm. of your own community your own people and also your own type of identity right yeah. um me personally what i have what i have found was um there's still a lot of healing to be done in our communities mm -hmm. you know uh uh, there's always this conversation, yeah, but, you know, colored people didn't have it as bad as us. Mm. You know, colored people were more favored by white people. In that saying, that already shows the power of what the brainwashing succeeded in, you mm. know, mm. that firstly a wedge was drif driven between all of us. True. And, the, and, and, you know, the irony of apartheid is, is that, the people who believe themselves to be superior, who feel that they lived in peace after that, also deny themselves the mm. opportunity to connect with their countrymen. So they even disenfranchise themselves. themselves yeah. They did without, just as much damage to, to themselves. themselves without, yeah. without uh, yeah. you know, wanting. And now you be, you're living in this, in this, <laughs> with this mindset and this belief that whatever it is, that you are living is the right way of living. And, and then, you know, you're being deceived, mm -hmm. super deceived. So mm -hmm. to come back to your question is, um, I can speak from my background growing up as a colored guy from Paul, mm -hmm. working in the Western Cape and then transitioning to work into Johannesburg and then connecting with other, other colored communities um, from Johannesburg and then with Durban as well and then see how you connect the dots and how everyone kind of like fits in. in Durban, mm -hmm. you find like a lot of the colored guys, they speak Zulu, they don't speak Afrikaans, mm -hmm. you know. So there is a different dynamic. I can't really talk about that type of dynamic because I'm from the Western Cape. True. You yeah. know what I mean? Yours has an Afrikaans uh, You know, my, base, my, yeah. mine has an Afrikaans, if, especially if you're from Paul, where mm. we're from, which is more Buolant. Yes. You know, it's not inner city Cape Town, flats Cape Town, mm -hmm. uh, type of Cape Townian colored. Um, 
So what I found was, I felt like a lot of colored people were still not loving themselves enough mm. and not knowing how to get to the root of who they really are. And it makes sense to me because you were removed from your property. Mm. You were taken from what was yours. You were stripped from your name. Mm. You were stripped from your clan. We give you another name. Mm. We give you an identity and we put you on top of each other. You don't even have your own land. You've got no more land anymore. You've got nothing. Mm. And we put people on top of each other and have them live on top of each other with their compounding issues and give them no resolve. We won't put libraries in your communities. Mm. We'll put liquor stores in your communities. Yeah. Okay. And what we will do is we'll actually infest your communities with drugs through the police, but then tell you it's because you don't know how to look after yourself. Mm. So what was done was basically uh, let, let's have them kill each other off and be the worst that they can be. Mm. And the funny thing is, it's not even funny, but if you go back to Cape Town now and you see what uh, Lavender Hill and what Hanover Park looked like 50, 70 years ago, it still looks the same now. There mm. has been no progress. Mm. There has been no forward movement. There has been no development mm. to get people out of that hole and to get them out of that mindset. Mm. So there's also a saying, a Dr. Seuss quote, which changed my life. And it says, he who makes a beast of himself gets rid of the pain of being a man. Mm. No. And I think when all of us, when our backs are against the wall, it's easier to protect ourselves. We become the worst version become of ourselves so I can repel the threat mm. and then say, yeah, I am the worst because that's what you believe in me. You've wanted, you wanted me to be someone that's hopeless and have no dreams and be this animal. So yeah, now I'm the animal because there that's the only yes. thing you have it, yeah. you know? And um, wow. that for me became something that I needed to guard myself against. And mm. also in the small capacity where I could offer a different vision and a different way mm. and, a, and, and just like different experience of self, that was what was, it's, it's always been my motivation and intention for doing well and for persevering at the end of the day. Yeah. So um, to further answer your question, I think there's a, a lot of healing that needs to be done in our communities. Mm -hmm. Even with under each other, you know, there's still the skin issue. There's still the hair issue where people believe this or people believe that. Mm -hmm. And I just feel the the only way to overcome those things is to really just show people that there's a different way of living. Yeah, There's a different way of experiencing themselves, but it's going to take a lot a of time. time. And also the, the wedge that you speak of, I remember, um, sorry, sorry to interrupt yeah. you, right? No, go ahead. I mean, the difference is uh, a lot of, and I, obviously African, mm -hmm. we're all African. Yeah. I was born here, my yeah, parents were yeah. born here, right? Exactly, and then your parents' parents were born you here. Know, yes. um, colored people don't necessarily have this tribe that, that they can say that they belong to. Mm -hmm. There's the Khoisan, there's the San, and then there's the Khoi mm -hmm. that we have obviously lineage to. But there, there's, there's a whole bunch of other influences uh, foreigners that came to the country, yeah. you know, uh, fornicating with the people of the land, mm. you know, then obviously having mixed race people. And then, uh, and, and, and here's the thing, you know, generational curses and generational trauma, then being pushed away because you are not a pure blood, you are not a thoroughbred of what mm -hmm. we are from. Mm -hmm. So we're going to push you to the side and make you feel like that and have make you grow up in a space where you feel like you don't belong. And I think a lot of colored people still struggle with that because mm. now we're sitting in a position where that thing is now a professional, it's no longer just a personal experience. It's a professional experience as it's well. true, yeah. You it know? translates itself it translates everywhere. Yeah, so yeah. what do I need to be then to survive? Whew. Who do I need to be then to survive? Mm. Because you will only accept me to a degree and then tell me after that, I'm not acceptable. Mm, you're not... Uh, yeah, well, yeah, where do you belong? <laughs> yeah, where do you belong? Like in whose camp are you? In what mm, camp are you? Mm. And that I think boils down to an individual experience of every person, every colored person as well. Do you find, uh, actually you probably answered that in your last statement, uh, that it boils down to everyone. Do you find that 
there's, it's a general state of, of mind that not sure where I belong. Does yeah. that, is that a reality? Do you experience it the same way? I did to a degree, to a small degree. I yeah. mean, um, the first time I had an opportunity to play sport against a white school, I was in matric. Okay, wow. That's a, quite a long time in your long schooling time. years. The, the first time I had an opportunity to actually interact with white people, really interact with them on a face-to-face -face level, uh, not just a teacher here and mm. there uh, at our schools or a music teacher. I'm talking about kids my age, my peers and whatever, mm. right? Um, wasn't when I was in university. Mm. Yeah. Up until then, my experience of of white people were always like, I'm not good enough to be in their homes. Mm. I'm not good enough to play with their kids. I'm not good enough to be on their property. Mm. Yeah. Right? I'm not good enough to go out with your daughter. Mm. So, when I went to university and Stellenbosch being the type of institution that it has infamously been renowned mm. for, you know, I experienced that on a different level. Now I experienced it in the education system. Mm. Hmm. And um, I'm getting prejudice, uh, you know, from professors and lecturers. Mm. I'm like, hmm. I'm just a kid that has got to take the train for four hours every day to be here. And you're going to tell me like, you're late again, Mr. Brink. Do you know what happens when you take the train at seven in the morning and it gets stuck on Maldus Drift Station? For no reason. And gangsters walk into your, and start mugging people and start stabbing kids for yeah. whatever change you have in your pocket. And you can't, tell the train uh, manager that they're going to drive now because no. you need to get to class. You just wait like everyone else. That's yeah. what it means when you're poor. Jeez. That's what it means when you grow up in an environment when you're not privileged. And when they told me at Stellenbosch University, uh, I went there and like we said, you know, I came with some form of momentum. I knew I had direction. I know that provision has been made for me and we didn't have a lot for me to go and get some form of education. I needed to be the best that I could be. Mm -hmm. and when I got to university and they told me, yeah, but first year students don't get any lead roles. You just build sets for fourth year students and otherwise. I was mm -hmm. like, I didn't come to university to be a set builder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I came here to be an actor, the best that I can be. Will you give me the opportunity to do that or not? After a couple of months when they resisted and I didn't get that opportunity, I was like, then I don't want to be in your institution anymore. I don't need you. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, that was the same year when I decided in my first year, I'm no longer going to Stellenbosch University. That was the first year that City Varsity, the first film school in South Africa. That opened up. Cape Town, that opened up. Yeah. And you and got I a was, chance to move. And I had to go audition to get into the, to, to the university. And um, Jeez. after two weeks, they've already closed their doors. They were full to capacity. I went there and I begged them. I said, please, can I just audition? Yeah. I went there and auditioned. And... Uh, they chose me, I got in. And in my first month of first year, they moved me straight through to final year. What? <laughs> yeah. You're one of those kids. Let's uh, move them fast. Well, look, once again, I think there were a bunch of um, elements that favored me. And yeah. um, right then, City Varsity was still a new institution, still within its forming years. They only had a two-year course with mm. third year being the honors. Okay. You know? But because I had credits, and obviously they checked oh, over the this Stellenbosch guy, credits. Stellenbosch yeah. credits, and the Dalro, uh, the national acting competition, they saw the I Steadfords also, you know, they could go and they said, but this guy's been doing it for 14 years already mm. before he came here. Mm. He's not new at this. So we need to give him the top level experience for him to transition, mm. you know, which they did. And... um yeah, that kind of like, uh, things were just in place that kind of like fast-tracked yeah, my success. That's great, eh? Yeah. At that stage. At that stage, yes. I want to go back to a moment in your life that stands out and everybody knows it. Even now, Nota spoke of it. It's yeah. a st stage in your life that is was quite, you were still a young boy, early in the acting game, already quite famous, I imagine, because the, the role that you played in the show backstage made you guys instant famous yes uh, and that came with the burden already at that stage as well yeah and you fall in love with 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 uh, with marubini at the time yes it, it, take take us to that time to the time of meeting this incredible girl and falling in love and and, yeah. and all of that hey man fairy tale stuff really yeah fairy tale stuff here i am uh 
film student, mm. filled with passion, really just want to be the best actor that I can be. Yeah. I'm one of only two members, three members out of the cast that's from Cape Town. Okay. Uh, and you were, you were, the show was shot in Cape Town. The show was shot yes. in Cape Town. You were yeah. home. So I was home, <laughs> kind yeah. Of. Kind yeah. of, yeah. Yes. You know, I'm in Cape Town, I'm from Paul, but yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. You're not far. I'm not that far. <laughs> like most of the Joburg kids. Yeah, most of the Joburg cats, you <laughs> yeah. know, who kind of like knew each other. So there mm. was also this bond that there. Yeah. And um, I felt like a bit of an outsider at first. Uh, and I remember um, Marubini came up to me one day and she said, you play Sean? Mm. And I said, yeah, I play Sean. She goes, I play Irene. I said, oh yeah, my audition piece was, I had to do a scene with Irene. Oh. She goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this was early, early, early. So eh? this was early, early. Yeah. And um, just a kind, spirited, mm. what backstage was successful at, well, many things, but they cast it very close to type. Ah, okay. Which is okay. what a lot of international filmmakers will also tell you, you know, cast mm -hmm. as close to type as possible because mm -hmm. then it's natural for that actor mm -hmm. to produce whatever they need the actor and what the character needs to produce. Mm -hmm. So Irene was supposed to be the sweet, innocent, girly, you know, mm -hmm. uh, pretty girl next door um, with a mushy heart and, you know, naive. Mm -hmm. And and she was, she was all of that. Yeah. Um, and obviously spending time together and having to do scenes with her, I started to recognize um, certain people for their, their traits. Mm, mm. And I resonated with, with her because um, I wasn't a big talker. I wasn't boastful. I didn't mm. know how to be egotistical. I didn't know how to walk around like I'm the man. Mm. You know, I was, a little, I was shy and I really just wanted to do well at my work. And I think... That's also what got people's attention because this guy is so focused. Why are you so professional? Why are you so serious? Like We're like, still kids. Yeah, just like enjoy yourself. I never drank. I never smoked. I didn't want to do any of those things, you know. Yeah. I just wanted to do great work. And um, yeah, man, uh, uh, like being a 19-year-old, 20-year-old, mm. uh, being on your first set, working closely with people. And now I have this, this girl who is more or less my age who's mm. being kind to me and showing an interest in me and me showing an interest in her obviously evolved into yeah. you know the 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 scenario set mm. for deep romance <laughs> you had no choice eh? you know i had i had no choice and i followed my heart and um yeah it yeah. was a, it was a really great experience you know Jeez. young and then obviously what followed was was really was really difficult. It was one of the most difficult things in my life you, that I had to you, go through. You, you engaged. You got engaged. I was actually on my way to go get engaged at home. Really? Yeah. I, describe that. So you had spoken to her. Yeah, I had spoken to her uh, previously about something. You know, similar. Like yeah, you I'm know, interested. Yeah, interested. You know, and she was a very like. Uh, uh, down the line, honest, straightforward, no games, no mm, mm, player, player mm. nonsense. I want a good, honest um, man that I can introduce to my mom. Okay. You know? Okay. Uh, so therefore, there was no funny business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we drove down from um, Petersburg then to to Paul, my hometown, over okay. the December holidays. And I remember I had a conversation with my dad before that, and I said, you know what, man? My dad and my mom got, got married when they were young. Mm. Uh, they had me when they were young. So I, I really liked that type of relationship. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to start my love life. Quite early. Quite early. young. Yes. Yeah, because I, I it just looked magical, and, and the beauty in two young people growing together was something that fascinated me and obviously as kids you emulate what you see mm. um so i told him i said look yeah, i'm going to deposit some money into your account i don't have the rest can you just help me out with some bucks and get a ring for her so when we get home i want to do it when we get home and he was like listen I'm, are you sure that this is what you want to do and i said yeah and he's like i'm really happy for you cool yeah i'll do it for you and i and i wanted to keep it a secret and i never got to make it home um yeah, sadly. Uh, so, so the accident, you were heading home. Yeah, we were. I was. I was on my way home. We yeah. were heading to 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 my home in Paul. To the ring. To the ring to get to the point where I could, you know, propose and see what was that, what that was like. 
Was she looking forward to meeting your parents? She spent time at home already. Oh, she had yeah. seen them. Yeah. Sibu Siso Khadebe. Yes. Myself, Sibu, and Marabini, we shared a flat. Okay. So, um, and obviously Marabini's mom was very strict. My mom was very strict. So mm. they were like, listen, the weekends, we want to see you. We want to be <laughs> in the house. You need to, you know, because we're living in Cape Town, we could go through to Paul and spend some time with my family, mm. sleep over there. So they, they, they knew, knew her. Yeah, they yeah. knew her and they loved her. Yeah. Yeah, and she loved them. Jeez. So you were a minute away from engaging, from formal, formalizing the From center. formalizing that engagement. Jeez. And uh, two cars forced me off the road and kept on driving and no one stopped. And, um, you know, on the, when, when someone passes away on the state's roads and there are no witnesses, they have to investigate. It to becomes what? Culpable hom cul homicide. Culpable homicide, yeah. yeah. And here I am, 20... 20 years old, 21 mm. years, yeah, 20 years old. 20 years old on the 1st of, on the 1st of January, 2022. That's wow. when the accident happened. We, we all remember the news. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, man, the process of, of, of life after that was, yeah, I, I think nothing, nothing really can prepare you for, for anything of that nature. Mm. And uh, I mean, I remember the car accident happened on over the weekend mm. or Monday or Tuesday. I think it was a Monday or a Tuesday. She passed away. We had to go to the funeral that weekend. Mm. And literally a week after the car accident, I was back at work. And I never had a day off after that. I never took three months off. I never took a month off. I never had a week off to go rehabilitate myself. Mm. People ask me, so how did you heal? I was healing myself in front of people's eyes while I was on screen by myself yeah. and the support of my family. As a young man moving, having to move to Joburg and having no family and sleeping on people's floors. And the only thing that I had to cover myself was the clothes that I had in my bag at that point in time. And all of this weight mm. and nowhere to take it. Fortunately, I was just blessed to have God really just put angels around me, people who would literally take me one person and, and would just go, just look after him today. Mm -hmm. Just spend some time with him today. Mm -hmm. Who are those people, for example? Uh, Maduva. She was, yeah. Yeah, you know Maduva. But yeah, there's the singer. The gospel singer, yes. yeah. She was a good friend of, of Marabini's. Wow. And I remember when I moved to Joburg, uh, I slept in Sisanda Hena's dorm room floor i slept on his dorm room floor at Vitz tech the first day i got to Joburg. i don't even remember how i got to Joburg, because i only started drinking after the car accident before then i didn't and i didn't know how to cope i didn't i didn't know what to do i mm. didn't have my family with me i was just asked to come to the biggest show in south africa i needed to get out of cape town at that point in time because everything just reminded me of the life that i had there and i didn't know how to I mean, I still had to go to work and her dressing room was still there. I had to pack all of her clothes in boxes and send it to her family. I had to do all of that stuff on my own. It was really, really difficult being 20, 21 years old, you know? Ooh. And um, it almost reads like a, a, a movie script. Look, I don't, think, I don't think people really know what I had to go through. I think this is probably the first time that anyone's really asked wow. me. And I didn't want to have, I didn't want to talk about it too much because I also realized pretty early on uh, that sensationalism is also a real thing. And people always just, every, every article that was written about me was like, uh, Clint, broken hearted, car accident, mm. you know, who lost his fiance. We just saw him at this club with Latoya Makene. Yeah. Is he now dating again? Meantime, these were people who just wanted me to be okay and, yeah. and said, listen, we'll give you a safe space. We'll give you a safe space to cry all you need to cry, you know? And mm. so the people that I had around me, Kabomu and mm. I lived together for a long time. Um, mm. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, like I said, Maduba. Mm. Mm. Um, but that, that's when you moved, you moved to Joburg, to Generations. Yeah, that's when I moved the, to the, Generations. There, must, yeah. there, were, there was obviously time before you moved. Yes. When you were still working. Uh, I was still with, working with, at with Backstage. backstage yeah. Yes. And, yes. And, and she wasn't there anymore. She wasn't there anymore. That was really hard for me. That was really tough for me. I remember um, 
In fact, I remember waking up in hospital after the doctors tried to sedate me the whole night. From uh, the accident. From the accident. Yeah. They said, you need to, Mr. Brink, everything is fine. You'll be okay. Just you know, relax. Everything will At be okay. At this stage, you don't know. At this stage, I don't know what's going on. You know, we got wheeled into the hospital. You were traveling with, with her. You were driving with the sis, with her sister. Yeah, with her sister. Lerato, I think. Yes, yes. Lerato. And... Um, I mean, we got to we got to the hospital and they were packed to capacity. And they said, there's no beds available for you. So they put me on the coroner's table. Mm, mm. They say, also said, we don't have any anesthetic. So we're going to have to sew you up and fix you. Were you badly we, injured? Um, dislocated my collarbone, my shoulder, my jaw. Uh, minor injuries, really. Minor injuries. Well, le- le- relative. <laughs> relative, yeah. you know. Um, and her sister, her sister fractured my sternum. That, that's a lot of <laughs> injuries for you to say they are minor injuries. Yeah, I only discovered that when I got to the hospital because I couldn't breathe properly, and then they saw that my shoulder was hanging. Oh, obviously because of the seatbelt. Um, and her sister, um, was... she had, I think she had fractures in her hands, mm, mm. scarred in her hands. Uh, but yeah, we we had minor injuries. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then needing to piece myself together after that mm. while being on the biggest show in the country. My God. And all of this pressure on me. And, you know, this this is the thing that was so incredible about this, you know. Um, while I was, to answer your question, while I was still working at Backstage, mm. uh, just before the court case happened between um, Mfundi and ETV. Oh, yeah. That yeah, was that. that I mean, that's or... why the whole move happened and they yeah, came okay. to Joe Berg and all of that stuff, right? Um so when that move happened, Fundi was like, I'm going to take some of the guys from the show. Would you to like the to other show. To the other show. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I was like, this is just God bailing me out so I can go somewhere else. That's just not what I know. Yeah. But I remember coming, pitching up to uh, what I wanted to say was, so I wake up in hospital uh, the day after. and um, Still don't know. Still don't know. Yeah. And my mom and my dad and my two cousins were there. And uh, my mom, being the type of individual uh, she is, she looked at me and she said, God gives and God takes. That's the first thing she says. She didn't say, how are you doing? I'm so happy to see that you're fine. And she looked at me dead in the eye while I was lying in the hospital bed. And she says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes. Hmm. And then I broke. I think I cried hard for about 10 seconds, even probably even shorter than that. And everything just switched off inside of me. Jeez. And uh, I got off, um, got up off the hospital bed. The doctor was like, you still need to be here for observation. I looked at him and I said, I asked you yesterday if everything's fine. You told me everything is fine. Mm. I can't trust you. Just let me go home. Yeah. Let me just, let me just let me go home. Mm. Took the neck brace off, took out the drains and whatever. And I left. And I remember that drive from the hospital back home was the most sobering experience that I had in my life. The sun was shining. You know, the taxis, music was blaring out of the taxis. People were laughing, going to the shop, buying bread, buying milk. Mm. Life just carried on as per normal. And I looked at this and I said, how is that possible? Hmm. And it just showed me, you know, life is a contact sport. That's mm-hmm. where I I got that saying from. I, I was like, life is a contact sport and you can choose. You can either stop participating and then become a spectator, but it's going to keep on going. It's going to carry on without you, whether you want to play or not. And yeah. when you do play, you have to make peace with the fact that you're going to have to take some big hits. And that is one of yours. And that was one of my big hits, you know. Also, in retrospect, it's been one of, uh, and it's maybe controversial to say it like that. It's also probably one of the best things that could have happened to me because I know what real life looks like and tastes like. Mm. Mm. Not the upside, all of the good side, the candy coated mm. side, mm. you know. Mm. Life is suffering. And the human spirit and the human condition was designed to perpetually be in a state of overcoming. And if you are not in that state, if you are living a life of constant comfort, you are actually killing yourself yeah. slowly. 
because life will throw the good and comfort the bad. is the enemy of the organism mm. it's 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 proven scientifically in in every way and fashion these days even biblically it's spoken about you know mm. Mm. you want to gain muscle guess what you're going to have to do There'll be resistance pain. training mm. so through resistance you get stronger yeah jeez that's how it's designed and um I mean, I didn't want to accept that reality at that age, especially when the lesson came packaged in the way that it did. Jeez, the, the loss of, in fact, that was my biggest fear. What it would be like to lose someone that I love the most in front of me, you know. I, I, I didn't think I would be able to do it. And then there were a couple of people who also spoke shit afterwards. Uh, I remember one Simunye mm. presenter mm. went on air and said drunk driving has cost the lives of many during this festive season case in point Marubini Mukhale implying that you were drunk that I was drunk yeah which I wasn't because I I didn't know anything about booze then mm, mm. <laughs> I was too scared I was the clean prep boy you know yes um which also hurt me a lot mm. and and then you know, constantly having to go to court every month or second Yo. month while working at Generations, while not having family here and the support of family close to me and still needing to adhere to a 12-hour a day, five-day-a-week schedule. With Generations. With Generations yeah. and, and not have enough money to go home and see my parents or my people when I wanted to. It was really, really difficult. How was it dealing with uh, Marubini's family? They loved me. Yeah. And they loved me and they knew what type of person I am and was then. Mm. And they were no, you know, I remember um, Nkangwerini Mukhale, her mom, mm. uh, my Joyce Mukhale. Uh, early on, she told me, she said, listen, all of that feelings of guilt that you might have, stop it. Mm. It's an accident. You couldn't foresee what was going to happen. Please. We love you. We are here for you. Yeah. And we are here for your healing and your mending in whatever capacity. Um, and then obviously, you know, going through the stages of grief and me being the person that I was, you know, I, I felt like it was my responsibility to fix myself. Mm. My responsibility to fix myself. Now, that also taught me uh, another lesson, how we become very selfish in our pain. What do you mean by that? Well, all of us, you know, I, I think a lot of us, and especially for creatives and artists, remember, we also, that pain kind of like gives you an edge to your artistry mm. because it comes from a real place. It's not, you are not, not being put a up. mime. It's not put yeah. up. You're, you're yeah. extracting it. But what happens then is that a lot of artists don't want to move past that point because they get to the point where they feel like they can no longer be special without their pain. Okay. Okay. They never find that resolve. They want to stay in that spot. They so, become dependent on it, actually. Perform. Yeah, to perform. Mm. To to have that confidence within themselves to say, like, I'm I'm actually a really messed up guy and that's what makes me great at my craft. Mm. To a degree, yes. But also then it also becomes your cop-out. It also becomes your comfort zone. Mm. And I was always the type of person to challenge myself on those things and say, uh, you can't have a dependency on on, on, on anything. On anything. Yeah. You, you say you you went you started drinking. Yeah, heavily. After that. After that. Yeah. Heavily. I I didn't have any other coping mechanism. I didn't know how to do it. Mm. Didn't know what to do. I couldn't speak to people. What What do you tell them? What do you say? Hmm. I remember I went to. Uh, backstage one morning and I literally I was drinking the entire evening slept in the parking lot uh, a couple of minutes before I needed to be on set mm. opened the door just kind of like fell out of the car and the th because I needed to numb myself to what I would experience first thing in the morning when I went to work and what I experienced first thing in the morning when I went to work was I would look in the eyes of my co-workers mm. And I could see them dying inside for me mm. when they looked at me because they were like, how is it possible for this guy to go through this and he is still here and not knowing what to do about it? I could feel all of that stuff that they felt for me. Yeah. And I couldn't look them in the eye sure. because 
I was already smashed to pieces. I was broken, you know. Mm. And uh, this is also now what has fueled my belief to what it is today and what it is right now is that even in all of that weakness and being stone drunk, mm. no producer, no director, no writer, no production manager mm. of any show that I've worked on in the last 23 years can claim that I was not capable of doing my job to the highest degree. I would go in there and not fluff my lines. Mm. I would go in there and do exceptional work over and above the fact that I was dealing with really, really hard issues. Hmm. And I mean, now it's, it's, it's so weird for me. 23 years later, my dad passing away on the 1st of August. I bury him on the 6th of August. The 8th of August, I'm back at work, working yes. 7 to 7. Yeah. Another repeat of something similar, mm. you know. And I remember the weirdest thing happened. I was driving in the car on my way to work. And my head was like, wow, brah. No breaks for you, hey, my guy. Mm. You just have to, you just the, the work donkey. Just keep whenever, going. whenever anyone needs you to bail them out of the schedule, whenever they need someone reliable, you know, you are the guy that does that. Mm. You know, when are you going to have an opportunity to just have life for yourself? And right before I wanted to give into that feeling where the wheels came off, I saw my dad and my dad was like, hey, mm. remember, there where other people crumble is where you blossom. You were made for, you were made for times like these. Whoa. You don't need it to be easy. Mm. This is where you thrive. Go and show them what you're made of. Do you think though, with, with your dad's words in mind, that you genuinely needed a time off? Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah. who wouldn't? A time, <laughs> complete stop. Yeah, complete stop, a complete halt. Yes. Um, I was just driven mm. by my need to succeed and my need to not be defeated, that I wouldn't even allow the worst of things that have happened to me to be reason enough for me to say, to I can no longer move forward. Wow. I can't. That's crazy. I, I don't know. I don't want to do that mm. because there's still so much to do. Yo. There's still so much to do. 23 years, yeah, cool. That's, I feel like I'm just beginning, really. I don't feel like people have really seen mm. who I am yeah. and what it is that I'm really uh, capable of, you know? Do you know? I don't think I've really experienced the highest the best form of, of myself you. Yes. yet. I'm working on it. Did you ever blame yourself at all? Were and there moments where you felt the weight of the yeah, blame and I the guilt? Felt, I always felt the weight. Yeah. I always felt the weight. But I, I couldn't blame myself because I knew what happened. Yes, yes. I saw with my own eyes uh -huh, what happened. Uh -huh. it, was in not, it, was, it was not in your control. It was not in my control. Yeah. It was an accident. Do but afterwards, I mean, you always have these questions where you ask yourself, okay, but why did I have to be the one to be in that position? Yeah. Irrespective if it was an accident or not, how do I look a mother in her eyes now? Oh. Well, how, will I, how am I going to do that? How? Mm. You know? What oh. do you say? Mm. And, um... Is that, I'm, I'm sorry, doesn't sound like the right words. You know, there's, that's not enough. Yeah. That's definitely not enough. Sure. So, yeah, for, for, for years, I mean, those questions came up for me. But always, I could not... And I think maybe this is this is just God's protection for myself as, as well. You know, I could not get to the point where I said, yeah, it was my fault because it wasn't. Mm -mm, yeah. How far did the, the sadness and the depression and the alcohol, how far did it go? Man, it went for years while I was still working on Generations as well because then other things started kicking in for me and I started seeing, hey, but how come I'm being treated a certain way? How come people are not respectful of my situation? Mm. What How, are you seeing when you say that? I would say I started finding out from other actors what their true worth was, what they were getting paid for. Oh, okay. Yeah. And because I have a history 
over 15, 16 years of history before I even started professionally in the entertainment business. 12 years of history, mm. no? 14 years of, of momentum before professionally getting into the entertainment <clears throat> business. And I mean, I'm always competing with some of the top people, Gosh. top guys in the land. I know the difference between what it is it takes for you to be great, mm. you know? And, and where you will fall short. And I looked at a lot of people and I looked at the, the system of things and I'm like, so what qualifies this person to be on that level and to live that life? Is it, is it the, uh, the size of their sacrifice? Mm -hmm. Because if it is the size of their sacrifice and not their ability, I've lost a lot now. I've got yeah. no home here. I've mm -hmm. got no people here. I have to really just have my own wits about me and do my best to apply myself where I either don't destroy myself and I still need to, I really still need to achieve things that because that's my only saving grace. I need to be successful to say that, you know, I can overcome this thing. Mm -hmm. How do I do that? Hmm. And when I saw that there, you know, there are other things that also happen behind, uh, uh, behind the cameras, <laughs> you know, behind, <laughs> behind closed doors, certain people's mindsets. I didn't know anything about nepotism or tribalism All of that. or racism really because that was never that was never a part of anything that I mm. attached myself to. Yeah. And then to experience that and to be an outcast really. I Whoa. felt like an outcast a lot in the entertainment business. I don't have a clique. I don't have a group of people that I hang out with. I mean, if you you can go through my social media and check out for yourself, you don't see me taking pictures with other mm, celebrities. Mm, or, mm. Yeah, it's me and my family, you know. Mm, geez. Even though I've worked with the best of the best in this country, of I've course. gone toe to toe with them. And, you know, people will tell you because of my work ethic and my dedication to, yeah. to excellence, who I am. Do you think you, you are now part of the acting family? Or you still, you still the outcast. I it's it's weird. That's a really cool question. I don't, I don't know really. Mm -hmm. There was a point in time where I thought I knew, but things have changed. Yeah, I mean, people who uh, who more or less had the same mindset that I did, spoke the same language that I did, um, have moved on to other spaces. It's mm -hmm. not just you know uh, being in the acting capacity where. Um, funny things happen. Also, you know, in the corporate level, which I have very little experience in, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people will tell you about the experiences. So I think there are people who um, recognize my contribution. There are mm -hmm. people that respect me for my contribution. Um, but lately, I, I think on, on, a, on a mass level, on a, on, a, on a big level, I don't think I'm really taken seriously anymore <laughs> you think so yeah that's a big statement yeah i think because if i was taken seriously i would be on the front line of what needs to be done right now i'm talking about um high level experiences high level performance and delivering that on an international platform if possible okay you yeah know? but uh like you know previously like we've spoken about um you know, things have changed. The reason and the intentions behind people doing certain things have changed. The reason behind productions. Have the changed. reason behind productions have changed. Yeah. But I also think that, I think that is also a necessary phase for every artist to go through. Mm -hmm. I think like with bodybuilders, you know, you have a pre-season thing or like, sorry, like a, a pre-show experience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in season. You mm -hmm. see guys are super in shape and stuff. But there's also an off season mm -hmm. where they got to do a lot of the heavy lifting and they don't look as great. And, you know, going to do all of, it's like a quiet season, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And in that quiet season or when no one's really paying a lot of attention, that's when most of your work should be done. Yeah. In that quiet time. So when they say lights, camera, action, you're shredded and you're ready to go do what you need to do. You're always ready. You're always ready. And this is the other thing that was also difficult for me in the t entertainment business is that even when the priority was my emotional and my mental health that should have taken precedent, mm -hmm. I could not not be on. You had to be. Because what happens if I don't get that opportunity again? Yeah. Currently right now on TV, how many colored people do you see uh, shows are being built around? 
Mm. Leading men, don't see them. Mm-mm. Don't find them. Go check out any show on Netflix, yeah. Showmax. There's no shows built around leading colored men. Mm. No, things have changed. So I knew this early on as well. I'm like, there might come a point in time where, you know, what people see and what people prefer might change. Mm. So how do you constantly ensure your survival? You know, what do you do to make sure that you are still able to produce quality? And that has always been my focus. My focus was never on an award. My focus was because I've won all of those things when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And then when I had my first uh, wake-up call to what it's like, I'm like, the only thing that you can actually focus all your positive energy on Mm -hmm. is doing good quality work, building good relationships with people on set, being an honest, upstanding, upfront guy being trustworthy, being dependable, mm. being useful. True. You know, and um, a lot of my energies were focused more on that when I started realizing, hey, but there's a lot of other factors that I can't, yeah. that's out of my control. All I can do is show up, be great, you know, mm. and the rest is up to God. It's been a, it's been a, it, it, when I look at your years on TV and you said it, it's consistent work. Yes. Have you had a downtime, like a horrible downtime that a lot of actors speak of where it says there's just no work and it's been like this for a while? No. Never? No. That's Never. incredible. That's exactly why I feel like, look, there are people who wake up in high school or in a university mm. and then reconnect with the feeling of wanting to be artistic and saying, you know what, man, I want to be an actor. This is mm. what I want to do, mm. right? Many are called, few are chosen. This is not a skill for me. This is not a talent for Mm. me. This is not something that I had to go and develop. This is a gift that was put inside me. Yeah. I know that because the way that I apply myself when I look at people next to me, I don't have to work as hard as they do. Mm -mm. And when I do work hard, the results will show for itself. True. You know? Yeah. Um, So I have, (laughs) to be honest with you, all I did was focus on the work. Mm. All I did was focus on being respectful um, of my space, of my co-stars, of my colleagues, mm. of the opportunity. I never got to the point where I was wasteful with any opportunities and where I was at, even though it was painful or difficult for me. I didn't push it away. I didn't treat it like I was entitled or spoiled or whatever. Mm. And that has seen me have 23 years of consistent contribution in the entertainment industry. Here's a phrase that stands out about what you said, not being wasteful of the opportunity. That's, a, yeah. that's an important phrase because a lot of people, a lot of us, and I'll, I'll add me and, and as a part of the human race, yeah. get opportunities. Yeah. Some are not obvious, some are very obvious, yeah. but we don't always appreciate them or see their worth as much as we're supposed to. And you speak of a phrase that I've never heard anyone say before, that you've never been wasteful of your opportunities. Never. That's a big phrase. Never. Do you see, do you see that though? Whether with people you know or from a distance or just people being wasteful of those opportunities. For that it. vocabulary to exist in your mind, yeah, it's I've clearly seen it. something you've seen. I've seen it with people. And I've seen, I've seen the things that that stifle them, that kind of like, you know, chop them off by the knees for them to fall into that pitfall of either be feeling entitled mm. or, you know, it's just one small slip up for you uh, professionally that can actually cost you your career, either your ego taking over, mm. um, uh, you know, that type of stuff. And um, I, I, I just couldn't do it. Mm. I, I just couldn't do it because I was all, I always told, and I think maybe this was the blessing in, when I was younger, not feeling like I was made, you know, that mm. I'm the top guy mm. because I always had to work hard yeah. to get to where I wanted to be. Everyone was telling me, you're talented. For me, I was like, but what does that mean? Mm. That's for me means very little. What happens if you don't have work ethic? Because I didn't feel talented a lot of times. Mm. I felt like I was average, sometimes slightly above average. Mm. And I felt like, you know, when I was younger, it's also, uh, you know, you need to be able to have some form of discernment between moments to know that when it's time to go and when it's time to shut up, mm-hmm. when it's time to listen. 
And for me to to be where I am today, there has been some form of favor. And I see it with people, man. I see it with people uh, walking onto set and then starting to complain about the storyline, starting to complain about the character, starting to complain about the work system, starting to complain about publicity and PR that they're getting, starting to complain about all of these things. Mm. And all that does is you just start becoming, you are the one that's starting to make your ecosystem toxic for yourself, mm. you know? And I just couldn't allow myself to do that. I was too scared. <laughs> I, honestly, I was just too scared to scared have that off. type. Of, of blowing my own horn about, mm. you know, of becoming the self God. Pride always precedes the fall, you know? And I've seen it with people around me who have had talent and they then became their talent. Mm -hmm. You know, they were bigger <laughs> than people, larger than life, and I just couldn't have that. Pride always pre uh, precedes the, the fall. fall. The Ellen uh, Bucky's story. Yeah. An important story in society. A story that I think not many people know of. A story that I think everyone should know, particularly now in 2023 where every second home has someone that uses drugs. Yeah. What, what did you take from that, from being a part of that, of that production? I think the bigger question um, that came up for me after that was... There's a lot of things that we don't understand as people. There's a lot of things that we misdiagnose, mm. right? And we are misinformed about a bunch of things. For instance, you know that saying, you are what you eat, right? Mm. I don't think people really understand that context. Your vagus nerves runs all the way from your stomach straight to your brain. Yeah. It's now been shown that poor nutrition, what you eat, can lead to depression. It's even shown that poor diet can give you autoimmune diseases and that all of these things can be reversed through nutrition. Mm. So now what happens if people uh, don't have work and they have to eat what is available to them that has no nutritional value for years and years and years, compounded by a reality where there's hopelessness, there's despair, mm. and there's no future for you, not allowed to dream yeah. all the time, right? And then we, when people act a certain way, we want to say that it's their behavior that got them with it. You know, we're not addressing the full story, story and the full problem. Mm. A lot of people in prison should be in hospital. A lot of people in prison should have seen psychologists. Mm. They needed healing. They needed that more than just being condemned and locked up and say, we don't know what to do with you. And there you go. The system failed a lot of people. The system still fails a lot of people, a lot of us all the time. And that made me sit up and go, listen, not everyone's story is cut and dried. Their life is intricate. There are many things to, to consider and to be compassionate about. And then, um, yeah, just being able to be a part of, of, of a feature film like that was really great for me in whatever capacity I was able to, to contribute in. In fact, um, the lawyer, Adrian Samuels, everyone had an opportunity to meet, um, you know. Because uh, uh, it's a, 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 you're talking about the real guy. The, yeah, because so yeah, you're, you're, you're acting, a, it was a, a true story. Yes, yes. Yeah. so Jill Levenberg that uh -huh. played Ellen Parkes had the opportunity to talk to Ellen. Wow. You know. Uh, and Jared, get to understand and get to understand and you know also just that facial recognition body language talent demeanor energy you mm, know mm. you pick up on all of those things and then Jared Gedult, um who then played A.B. Pucky's um, also had an opportunity to just speak with uh, with Ellen and then you know um, there were lots mm. of things uh, uh, that contributed to, to yeah, the performances yeah. I Got a did, chance to meet I the lawyer. Not, I did not have a chance to Whoa. meet the lawyer, really. I didn't know what he looked like. Mm. Um, I didn't know what it was I needed to actually uh, emulate in that point in time. So I just went in there and just gave my own contribution of, yeah. you know, the knowledge or the background, the info that they gave me. And uh, I got a voice note from Adrian Samuels that was sent to the director, uh, 
Darren Joshua. The, the real guy. That's it. <laughs> Man, that sounded just like me. I just didn't wow. recognize the face. <laughs> and I remember at the screen. I remember at the screening of the first screening of Ellen Park is as well. Uh, I had a high court judge come to me. He's retired already, mm. and he said, "If I didn't know that you were an actor, I thought that you were a lawyer. You were really, really great." <laughs> wow! You know, so we we do what we can in whatever capacity Amazing, is offered. Eh? Yeah, because because for me that that's a story that young people should be shown. Yeah, and it's a story that parents should be shown. Yeah, because it's such a it's a story that is multi layered. Uh, in terms of the socioeconomic realities of our lives, but also the family dynamics. Yeah. Because drugs are such a big problem. And what did you take out from the role that drugs play in, in the communities that we exist in now? Man, what what can I take from it? I, I grew up in, in, in these areas where you see what it does to people's lives. I saw yeah. what it did to some of my friends, you know, going to prison while they were still in high school, oh. you know, being gang affiliated, some of my friends being killed, stabbed to death, shot to death. Yeah. You know, you're going through, you you go through all of those things, being in the area, growing up in an area where you know you can't walk here at this point in time, you know, our school's being locked down because there's a gang fight happening with some of the kids who are gang affiliated that's at school mm. and they are shooting from across the road from the flats into the school and them firing back into the flats that side. Like I, I grew up with that, you know? So I, I saw the ripple effects and just what, again, man, by the grace of God, mm. that was something that I never had to a pitfall that I never had to mm. fall, fall into. Essentially you, you survived like that community because that's I that is survival. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Not I, to be a part of any of this. A hundred percent, you know? Jeez. And, um, I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say uh, actors go through different lengths to prepare for certain roles, mm. you know. And also in the entertainment business, we know that it's not uncommon for people to have uh, recreational drug use. Mm. It's, it's, you know, part of the music industry, part of the entertainment business. It's yeah. seen like, you know, the ropes are kind of like not so tight, tight, mm. so tight, so explore yourself, whatever. And um, I am fortunate to not ever have been part of caught that. up and part of anything like yeah. that, you know? Yeah, that's such a, yeah, because, geez, drugs have taken over, man. It's a sad reality of our life. Personally, I feel that thing is so demonic, man. Mm. Having having a craving for something that destroys you and you can't stop it. You don't know how to shake it. Yeah. You know, something that tells you we need to do this now, even though you know that me doing this is wrong, is wrong but you can't stop it. It's holding you against your own will. It's holding you ransom. Yeah, man, and I feel I, I I feel for families. I really do. I feel for the individuals. I feel for the families. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm 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 just really really grateful that my my mom didn't have to walk that that journey with me. You know. Mm. You you played another role. What is it? Dollars and white, white pipes. pipes. Yeah. Yes. It's a role that speaks to that world as well. Hundred percent. Jeez. It's a true life story of Bernie Barchis, who yeah. I didn't know as well. had, that, had that life, really. No, I knew him. Oh, yes. <laughs> no, I knew him. Uh, how we got to know each other was interesting. So um, after the car accident, you know, um, I was trying to just cope mm. and um, piece myself together the best way I knew how. Um, some of my friends would take me out and say, ah, oh, bro, I just come out of the flat, you know, let's just mm. change the scenery, mm. go somewhere, buy me a drink and... Just be with me, you know. And uh, I went to Primi Piatti in 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 the waterfront, okay, because uh, we were still shooting backstage. And uh, you know, obviously, me being as sad uh, mm, going as through I a hard was, time. going through a hard time. The waiter came up to me and said, "Hey, bro, how you doing, man? I really re I read about what happened. I'm really sorry. Mm. Um, hey, man, listen, I'm gonna get you a drink on the house. Don't worry about mm, it." You mm. know, I was like, "Wow, nice guy," you know. And then, you know, the bull came and it was like, don't worry about it, man. I sorted it out for you. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, cool. Thank you very much. And then I would see him sporadically, you know, a week, two weeks after that, we would go back to the venue. He would be there like, listen, man, I organized some free shooters. Don't worry about it, whatever. Then I moved to Johannesburg. And uh, I remember the first time that I went to Primi Piatti in Rosebank. Mm -hmm. Now this dude, I see him, he's here. Hey, Same Mike. guy that was in Cape Town who was the waiter there is now you, the manager of Premier Piatti. Wait Rosebank. a minute. <laughs> He's like, hey, bro. Hey, man, good to see you. Uh, 
double jack and lime, right? <laughs> he even I remembers said, your drink. I said, yeah. He goes, that's cool, man. Listen, so what are you doing in Joburg? We had a bit of a catch up and sat there. And obviously I was still on the mending, pr- mm-hmm. the mending process. Mm-hmm. And um, he told me, he was like, well, you know, uh, I told him to open up a studio next door. They got a baby grand piano. So whenever you feel like coming to sit here and just... You come know, play you forget about the world come play and sing here and, you know I'll get you a dop and we'll sit and we'll just have a chat and mm. I also created a safe space for me and um, I was working on Generations at that point in time and then we had to shoot uh, an ad for one of the sponsors for Generations okay. uh, who was Distel at that point in time mm. right? and obviously my character working behind the bar you know, I was the guy handling all of the booze. Mm. So they came to me and said, listen, you're going to finish late tonight, but they're shooting an ad for Distel. We're going to pay you extra. Do you want to earn some extra cash? I was like, yeah, I yeah. need to earn some extra cash. Yeah. Cool, 100%. So uh, the director of the ad, mm. we had a light banter and he liked my sense of humor. Mm. He's like, mm. hey, you seem like a really intelligent, witty guy. And mm. Have you considered um, doing feature films? I'm like, that's what I studied for. That's exactly what I want to do. He goes, mm. oh yeah? I said, yeah. He says, I just got a script. Can I send it to you? Do you want to get, you want to come do an audition for me? Mm. And I said, cool. And that was the audition for Dollars and White Pipes and I did it and the character's name was Bernie, right? And so I did it and... Uh, what was the character's role? So the the story about Dollars and White Pipes yeah. is, the, is the life story of Bernie Barchies mm. who went from Hanover Park who ended up working for one of the biggest drug dealers in the country. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't want to mention real names mm-hmm. and all of these things. <laughs> and then uh, how he got out of the gang life and working for one of the biggest drug dealers to become a successful businessman and live his own life and defeat the odds, you know, a success mm-hmm. story. But also the way that the story was told was the first time that colored people in South Africa could see an honest representation of what it looks like to come out of the Cape Flats and a success story from the Cape Flats, right? The guy was offering you drinks. Who's that guy? That ended up being the guy that the film was about. So after Amazing. I did the audition, <laughs> the director was like, listen, I would like you to meet the dude who the story is about. And in walks this guy from Primi Piat and he goes, hey man, yeah man, so you're going to be me. I was like, what? <laughs> What's going on? You That's know? crazy. <laughs> and um, yet again, you know, if, if I take a look at how my life has been playing out, mm. How how can I <laughs> how can I be blind to the fact that there is not a hand of guidance and protection and favor on me for whatever reason? So I take what I do very seriously because not a lot of people have that favor. Mm. I know a lot of people who are way better people than me, really good people, yeah, with really good intentions that never had the opportunity to see the full potential of themselves and their lives. And here I am, a flawed individual that's had a really difficult time. Mm. I didn't make a lot of noise about it. I had a really difficult time. I made lots of mistakes. And here I am still blessed to be Mm. in a position where I can still contribute a lot of good. That should tell me that that is my higher purpose and not just me being great at my job. At this stage, when you were meeting him at Primi and all of that, he was on the, the other side of, of his life, meaning that he was now on the mend. He wasn't involved with all of that. Yeah, world. he was a restaurant owner by yeah. then, had a couple of businesses, <laughs> had his own thing going. You know, he stepped away from that. Amazing. Yeah, but, you know, it's really difficult to step away from that life. I can only imagine. Really You're never completely gone from you know, it. The, you know, there are one or two personalities yeah. that might still be in the shadows keeping tabs on you and whatever. And uh, I had an opportunity to meet uh, the antagonist, well, who the Jeez. antagonist was based on. You know, I had a, an opportunity to meet some of these people. Mm. And that was also like really just blew my mind <laughs> to what's going on in the bigger scene in South Africa. It's the really. underworld. It's the underworld. Yes. Yeah. It runs all the way straight up to the top people that we know, that you can think of, the top systems and institutions that we can think of. Incredible, you know? eh? Yeah. The life that you live now, which includes married life and yes. all of that. It's a look at how you smile. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, I like how you met your, your, your wife. Mm. And I like it because I, it seems so far fetched for some of us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Completely far fetched. Like this doesn't work. This doesn't, this world doesn't exist. 
how you shoot you shot your shoot or what do they say yeah, young man, people I, you yeah, shot your what, what you shoot it? your shoot, shot shoot your shot you shoot your yeah, shot yeah man i was a i was a good basketball player too three point shooter <laughs> you killer. did yeah. and it went in it went in two guard yeah not wow. even like off the board straight nothing but air amazing when you saw net. when no, you saw, it's an air ball nothing but net <laughs> where do you see it for the first time I saw her on the first time on Instagram. That's when I saw her for the first Just time. Just scrolling through. Yeah, and... we had a common acquaintance, um, uh, someone that also went to the Miss World competition. Okay. Right? And uh, when I saw this person was posting pictures, obviously with all of the other contestants and stuff like that, I was like, oh man, yo, Miss Russia. Oh, okay, you know, <laughs> here we see, um, who's this, what, Venezuela? And I click on him, it says Namibia. I'm like, Namibia? People from Namibia look like this? <laughs> hey, hold up. Went into a profile, saw a God-fearing person, athlete. At that point in time, I was really stuck into my training, which is another thing that I have to mention, mm -hmm. is that training was the one thing that kept me alive. Wow. Uh, beyond all your challenges. Beyond all my challenges. Yeah. It's the glue that kept me together. It's the thing, it's, it's the place where I took, where I went to, I would go down to the basement, mm -hmm. I would unlock the door, and I would call out the biggest, baddest demon that, that I had to face. Mm -hmm. I would put them in the gym and I said, today I'm kicking your ass wow. and I'm not leaving this gym until I'm done with you. Mm -hmm. And if I don't beat you today, I'm coming back tomorrow and I'm going to keep beating on you until you don't, you don't exist anymore, you know. And it gave me a positive progressive space mm. to really work through things you could have chosen anything why did you choose i was i was doing the booze thing but you know yeah, I, got, yeah. i got tired of the booze thing because <laughs> you know i it didn't do anything for you me you can only drink so much you can only drink so much and it became boring man you yeah. know you can't have any proper conversations with people around you everyone's drunk what's happening you know no <laughs> yes. um and um obviously me innately wanting to always improve on whatever it is my situation was and who I am, my skill set, whatever, always wanting to improve, that ended up not serving me mm, anymore. Mm. It's taking you backwards. Yeah, it's taking yeah. me backwards, not really doing anything for me. Yeah. Plus the people that I see around me, all of these guys that are drinking with me, they don't have anything that I can actually look at and go like, hey, that's the type of life I want. In fact, mm. I seem to be the front runner here, so <laughs> I need to set an example, really. Mm. Um, so gym. So gym became the thing for me. You know, it, it, it became yeah. the holding space for me. So I was deeply entrenched in training right there. And then so athlete, uh, God-fearing, didn't understand the concept at that point in time mm. fully. Um, and I was like, you know, how it goes on Instagram. I liked a couple of her pictures. She liked a couple of my pictures. Hey, you know, that's I, that's I followed, how it's done. This know. is this is how it's done. Yeah, no, we, this is not how it's done. This is how it worked for me. No, no, no. We need, yeah. to, we need to listen to how do you shoot your shot <laughs> you know, on Instagram. Have you abs, like, bro. You like, oh, oh, okay. You know, have Fest, abs. have abs. You know, have like, you know, 4% body fat. <laughs> yeah, have <laughs> striated deltoids, you know there what I mean. There you go. So you know? have abs. <laughs> okay. And shoot your shot. <laughs> shoot your shot. Like, like what? Like for like, like you know, you go like for like, you know, okay. follow for follow. Follow. And then, um, <laughs> obviously, I read some of her captions and I was like, wow, man, this is okay. someone with a different, seemingly a different type of mindset. Mm. I like this. I've had relationships that have shown me that, uh, you know, really being in, in relationships that didn't serve me. Ended up being with people who I cared about who weren't necessarily great for me. Okay. You know? Yeah. And uh, ever since, the, you know, after the car accident, It was a big thing for me to get to the point where I have a really good relationship with someone that respects me, that I respect. And, mm -hmm. you know, you can only imagine getting to that point is not an easy feat mm -hmm. with no mentorship, with not a big, strong circle and, and support structure around you, being out in the world as a young man, fending mm -hmm. for yourself and chopping out your own identity. Man, it not could easy. have been the end of me a long time ago, yeah. right? So here I am going like for like following this person. Hmm. I took a, a screenshot of one of her pictures and I DM'd her and I just said Screenshot DM. Screenshot DM. <laughs> caption said, Wow, you are gorgeous. Hello. Hmm. There's the line. We've always wanted to know the line. <laughs> wow, yeah. you are gorgeous. gorgeous. Hello. Hello. You do that. 
You'll be all right. No, yeah, don't get arrested for being a stalker. You know, they'll ban you on Instagram. Um, Jeez. And then she responded and she goes, yeah, oh, hey, man. Yeah, I also checked out your profile. And, you know, I, we spoke a little bit and I said, look. Um, I, I, I think something we're missing. You have to have a profile worth checking out. At the, maybe, yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah, because yeah. they will check you. They'll check you. Particularly obviously. if you're liking and liking well, and liking. Go down and see like, who are you? What are you doing? What are, what are you affiliated to? with? Yes, yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Do you have abs? <laughs> yeah, do you have abs? How did you acquire them? <laughs> there you go. Um, <laughs> and then um, I said, look, uh, I don't want to sound like a creep. I don't want to sound like a weirdo. Mm. But if you would like to have a conversation outside of this, this is my number. I'll leave it to you. You decide if it's yeah, something that you yeah. want to do or not. Because yeah. I, I, I was like, yeah, man, it can probably come across as a little bit creepy. But you, you were, you liked her at the stage, like you were. No, yeah. no, no, no. Okay. I, I, I liked, I liked the idea of having a healthy friendship, a healthy positive friendship with mm. someone. Okay, and you saw this and I saw this obviously yeah. it, it just so happened to be that they you know were missing Namibia yeah, hey, I couldn't do man. anything about that <laughs> yeah you didn't yeah. create that you yeah. found it there <laughs> yeah I'm fortunate you know what I yeah. mean <laughs> so uh, um, yeah she responded uh, texted me on WhatsApp and cool. texted for about three weeks before she came to South Africa um, there was a competition that they had in South Africa that she was participating okay. in. Okay. Uh, the organization wasn't done really well. Mm. She came to SA, was still waiting for the other competitors to fly oh, in. So she came in early. She came well. She came in at her appointed time. Okay. It's just you know the the organizers weren't really organized. Okay. Hey man, I think I think where the story is going, it worked in your favor. Man, it just seems like things do. <laughs> so um. I remember the first day she arrived in South Africa, she sent me a text. She was like, so I'm here. Uh, yeah, the other girls are not here yet. I don't know what's happening. We were supposed to get an itinerary. It doesn't mm -hmm. look like we're doing anything for the next couple of days. Uh, just letting you know. I was like, you know what? I was supposed to finish at five this afternoon. They moved all of my scenes up. I finished at 11 o'clock. Do you want to go for lunch? I'll come fetch you. That's it. She's like, cool. Now I'm excited. I've been talking to this person for about three weeks. Yeah. You know, every now and again, a bit of a voice call and, you hey. know, getting to know who she was. Mm, and, you know, mm. drove to Auckland Park where... Uh, uh, oh, that's where they were the, stationed. Yeah, that's where yeah. they were stationed. Went yeah. to go pick her up. And I remember I drove around the corner and I just saw legs. <laughs> and, you know, it's long hair. Oh, she's tall. Yeah, she's <laughs> tall, right? So I was like, okay. Legs. Got out the car, greeted her, greeted the people that was with her. Mm. And um, some of the, the ladies who were, I think they were working in the hospitality uh, mm. industry, they were like, oh, Tino. So she was like, Tino. I'm like, ah, don't worry about it. Mm. Open the door first. She got into the <laughs> what, car. Why? Do they recognize you? Obviously. Yeah, they're like, oh, you're my favorite. You're my favorite. I'm like, yeah, yeah. She goes, favorite for what? I'm like, ah, don't worry about mm. it, man. Ah, you know. <laughs> opened the door for us. She got into the car. We drove through to park. She must have known at least by then she that didn't. you were a TV star. She thought, ah, uh, actor, maybe he's like a wannabe guy. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, she didn't really know, <laughs> which was great for me. Yeah. Which was perfect. I'm having wow. a conversation with someone who's learning mm, me from scratch, mm. you know. <laughs> so we get to Greenside, we have lunch, and this the weirdest thing happened. Literally like it would happen in the movies where, I mean, over mm. over the span of like two decades, I've become accustomed to people saying, hey, man, I really like what you're doing. Can we take a picture, autograph, mm. or whatever? I'm sitting there for like three hours and there's no one. It's just quiet. I'm like, what is this? Is this it seems to be me and this person sitting here in this place. And Surely that's good for you. Yeah, that yeah. really stood out for me. I mean, it was, it really stood out for mm. me. So, um... And also the conversation was just like, I've known this person for a very long time. Yeah, it was flowing. So I was like, listen, uh, place in Parkhurst, really good cheesecake. Do you want to have a cup of coffee? Do you want to have you, a... Yeah, do you need to be you back? you want to have a dessert elsewhere? Yeah, let's go. Let's, <laughs> you know, let me show you around. And let's, let's take it. She's like, okay, cool, 100%. Yeah. So we walk back to the car, open the door for her. She gets in. I get in the, uh, the driver's side while she's still... I hope you still open the door for her. I still open the door okay. for her. Listen, I'm an R&B singer. This is what we do. <laughs> Come <Okay>. on now. <laughs> I have a policy about opening doors. Yeah. If you, if you're going to open it in the beginning, you better 
commit to doing it over and over and over again. I do that. Okay. My, mom, my mom also was like big on being a gentleman. Okay. So how you treat cool. ladies, you do it properly. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, while she's still putting on a seatbelt, I get into the driver's side. She's still looking down at the seatbelt. So mm. I just lean over and I kiss her. I put my seat Look at on. you. But not something serious. Yeah, you know but it's I mean? still a... You know. This is the first meeting. This is the first meeting, man. <laughs> you know. She's leaning over. I just kissed her. Oh, look at you. Fixed my mirror. You're quite a my confident she looked, chap. She looked at me like this. She was... And I'm like, okay, so where do you want to go? She said, wherever you want to go. I'm like, cool. Whoa. So we went to Parkhurst. We had uh, cheesecake and coffee. Uh. And we had a really, really good conversation. I took her home later that evening. Yeah. Um... And three months after that, we were married. Wait a minute. Yeah, and it's been seven years now. Wait a minute. Three months, three weeks, that's how long we knew each other and we got married. Jeez, that's that. didn't you feel like it was too quick? Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, both of us, we were kind of like commitment phobes to a degree, uh, you know, trust issues. Uh, not, but you still, you still went for it. My thing was like, look, how many of us can say that you really fully know someone? There are people who've been married for 10 years and mm. still say, well, I'm still trying to learn who this person is and figuring yeah. out who they are. Mm. So I'm like, I'm going to have to get to know them anyway. Yeah. So, hey, I crunched <laughs> the numbers. And for the first time, I did something that I never did before yeah. in choosing a partner or choosing, you know, to be with someone. Mm is that I went and I looked at their home life. Okay. All right. They came from a similar background. She came from a similar background as mine. Yeah. Brother and sister. Me, brother and sister. Mm. Parents were together. My parents were together. They come from a predominantly Christian background. Sport, education, mm. uh, responsibility, um, and and no toxicity within the family unit. Mm -hmm. It's it seems like this is yeah, clean. But before, yeah, but before then it was about yo, are you hot? Do I like you? Are you attracted to me? Am I attracted to you? Mm. I see your skill set. I see your potential. I really think that maybe if we put things together, we could be the it couple or whatever, mm. whatever, whatever. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and neglecting the important components of mm. you need to look at what system they come from, really. True. And once I did that, things changed. Hey, what changed? I had someone who, uh, look, if, if my wife and I had three big arguments in seven years, it would be a lot. Mm, wow. I'm not used to that. Mm, mm. You know, I've dated people in my industry and they, it was apparent to me that there are a lot of people who still deal with insecurity issues, mm. you know. And a lot of times I was with people, or the couple of times when I dated people, I was with people and I wasn't equipped to deal mm. with that type of setup. Okay. Because I didn't know it, mm. didn't come from it. And here I have someone who uh, we more or less speak the same language. We more or less have the same value system. Mm. And there is no really no big bone of contention. The only thing that we have to figure out is like, okay, you're 11 years younger than me. You're female. I'm 11 years older than you. I'm a male. How do we make things work? How do we settle our differences? Mm -hmm. And um, once again, man, listen, I, I think I had 900 bucks in my account. Jeez. At that time. At that time. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, because this was in between 2014 and 2015 before I got onto Bunna Landers and started working and you know, okay. I was freelancing. And I remember <clears throat> financially I wasn't doing so great at that point in time. And it hit me one day. I was sitting in my room looking over a uh, living room overlooking uh, the lawn on the outside of the room, that I, the house that I was renting. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm about to marry a Miss Namibia <laughs> and I've got 900 bucks Jeez. in my account. Ooh. Am I effing mad? What answer did you get <laughs> with that question? I prayed, bro. I yeah. prayed right then and there. I prayed and I said, Lord, here we go. Here we go, me and you again. We're about to have another conversation. Mm. This time, my request is, if you really do exist, if you really are here mm. and if you really can hear me and can communicate with me, please 
fix things on such a level in my life that when I am asked how did it happen, the only answer I have is to say, I don't know, God did it. Mm. Wow. Because I couldn't do it, you know. For, for the longest time, I felt like uh, growing up in Christian communities, we have an understanding of God here. Mm. Mm. Not the resonance in your spirit. We, it, that's still an... I think it's a very difficult. I think the God question is a very dif- difficult concept for a lot of people to grasp. Yeah. You know? And and I don't think it should just be taken so easily for people to just accept or reject it. Mm. I think there's an evolution and a process that needs to happen within that that's individual and unique to Absolutely. every person's journey. Yeah. So for me at that point in time, I mean, with the Muay Thai thing that I did for 15 years, uh, I went to Buddhist temples and I sat with the Buddhists and I gained a lot of in uh, um, insights mm. and valuable information from their life's perspective. Man, I've done ayahuasca ceremonies. Jeez, you've to, done that? Uh, yeah, <laughs> listen, I went I went out to discover, I wanted to find out what the truth is within the universal truth of this mm. life experience. And I yeah. needed to find it out for myself. For yourself. I didn't want anyone else's opinion. I wanted my truth and my truthful experience. Mm. So now I'm sitting and uh, I've got all of the stress on me. <laughs> And I said, Lord, please, I don't want to be someone else's quicksand. I need to be someone else's springboard. Mm. This is the pride of their country. Mm. Everybody looks, looks, everybody talks about it on a continuous basis. You know? And this is someone who knows me, who knows the ins and outs of my life currently, mm. and who says, Yeah, but I, you, you're that's the, the one. Person. You're the one. I'm, I'm choosing this person. And uh, for the first time in my life, right after that, you know, I got Ford sponsored. Jesus. <laughs> there know, it is. That's God's work. All of it, everything. In fact, to the to the degree where neither side of my parents had to pay anything for anything. Everything was covered. Everything was covered. Dude, you had a top billing wedding. I had a top billing wedding. Man, I had an outside <laughs> and an inside venue. Imagine that. You know, the band that was playing were, is the band that played for idols. That plays for idols. <laughs> that play, t- played for your wedding. You know, who, was my, who are my friends as well, you know. And I looked at all of this and I'm like, I had no... You had 900 bucks. I had 900 bucks. <laughs> I don't even want to calculate and say how much that wedding was worth. I no, of course. Dude, there, it, was, it was on TV. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, how? Uh, well, the answer is there. You gave it. It's... I don't know. You know, I got the thing is like, remember you and me, we, uh, <laughs> we had a convo. Yes. And really the, <laughs> the thought and the feeling that dropped in my spirit right after I prayed that was literally, it's like God said, you were looking for me. I'm going to show you what I'm going to do with your life. That is what I remember distinctly mm. after that. And since then, my relationship with my wife is nothing short of... I, 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 man, if, 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 if I didn't believe in the existence of a divine power, if I, if I, and, and, and I've tried it before in my life with all of the heartache and the difficulties that I've had, I've gone out in the world many times trying to prove that God is only for old people mm. and for people who don't have the ability to fix their own lives themselves. Mm. I went out numerous times trying to prove that there is no God. It's all in our heads and we needed to do that. Mm. But at the same time, while I was doing that in my anger and my bitterness and my, my hurt, he still did not allow me to drift into the deep end. Mm-hmm. Mm. Because it could have happened to me many times, man. I, I crunched the numbers over and over every day and I'm like, Jeez. so easily. Could have. Look at what happened to Doomy. Mm. Look at what happened to that kid that was the lead actor on Matuetwe. Yes. Ooh, that boy. Talented young boy for no reason. Just goes. Broad daylight, gets stabbed to death for a cell phone. Mm. Man, I've been in so many hair-raising situations. I should have been gone many times over. Yeah. And I ask myself, how? Why? Mm. Do you still, are you still here? Why am I still here? And 
when I look at my life now and I look at everything that I've been through, mm. it's an impossibility that I am either not in jail, mm. I am not dead. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I am still able, even now more so, I believe, to contribute more value. Mm. Do you sometimes, or not even sometimes, do you give credit to your, to your marriage uh, for the state of mind that, that you're in now? All the time. Yeah. All the time. What well, is it about it that, that brings you to that point? What is it about your married life? So I think it's weird, man. Yeah. I'm, I'm a guy that loves finding patterns in things, mm -hmm. similarities. Yeah. I'm an observer. You know, like I said, I listen, I study, I study mm, people, yeah. I look at them, I look at myself, I observe myself, I'm able to do that. And my wife was initially the type of person I was like, character wise, I wouldn't have gone for someone like that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I just felt like, uh, firstly, 11 years younger than me was never my vibe. Mm, it's too young. <laughs> no, I don't want to babysit people. <laughs> I need someone to inspire me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I need someone to be my equal. I mm. need someone, if I'm uh, in a position where I'm able to to give you some form of wisdom and insight, there will be times where I will need that from someone as well. Now, I don't want to be, mm. you know, at a loss for it. Mm. You don't want to be the good man in the relationship. Uh, no, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And um, I think for my wife and I, we both asked ourselves, the same question is like, do I have the sustaining ability to be with someone for a long time? Because also I'm someone that applies myself to a variety of things. Mm. I don't just do one thing. So it's easy for me to also get bored because I figure things out quickly. I'm able to apply it fast and then see that I have a favorable result in it. Yeah. So when I look at my marriage, man, I was dating people who stayed... 30 minutes away from me and I didn't see them for two, three months because they were busy. Jeez. And here is someone who is a Miss Namibia, yeah. who is the 100 meter hurdles record holder what? for Namibia, who was two time <laughs> South African wrestling champion, what? who played sevens rugby, women's rugby for free state, who was hockey team captain, who played netball, who did athletics, who did amateur boxing and amateur bodybuilding with me, right? We're talking yeah. about a bona fide super Athlete, hero, right? Yes. That person, after they didn't see me for a week, took the bus from Namibia for 22 hours to spend time with me. That solidified everything for me. It made me realize, stop crossing oceans for people who won't jump puddles for you. Mm -hmm. You know? <laughs> Yeah. And that for me said anything, said everything because yeah. I was like e everything over and above that. She didn't understand the whole artistic thing, being a musician at mm. first. She had love and affinity for musician, but couldn't under, you know, it wasn't really a thing. She was an athlete. Mm. And uh, I was like, but what happens if I get into the space where I need to produce stuff? Will this person be able to understand what my process is and whatever? Mm. And uh, my questions just came back down to the fundamental questions like, does she respect you? Does she, is she in support of you being the best version of yourself? Mm. Does she show her support? And I ticked all of those boxes. Everything else to me became inconsequential. I was like, you know what? I can actually work on those things. Mm. It's fine. It's a development thing that we can actually have fun with and exploring each other and exploring what life uh, lies ahead for us. Um, and that w was the deciding factor for me, you know? Yeah. So therefore, when, when I think of my marriage and I look at the favor that both my wife and I have in, in many spaces, it is really an, an answered prayer for me. Mm. An Jeez. answer prayer for me after after years of, you know, silent struggle of people not knowing, you know, the, the true desires of my heart and where I wanted mm. to be and how I saw myself and having to overcome so many things and having a spirit of overcoming and then still not being recognized as someone that has been able to successfully overcome. It's a lot of things, you know. Yeah. And yeah, I have really a shining light in my house. I have someone, I have an a, a in-house motivator, I have an in-house inspiration, I have someone who's loyal, you know, someone 
who really they couldn't care and that was the great thing i mean she was mm-hmm. like oh so you're you you do t-. she was like you never told me that you were this famous never. <laughs> when Because did you find out like i think within a year and a half of us <laughs> being together she was like listen so this was i'm like yeah i am a Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Comes She's with... like, oh, I just thought like you maybe want to do like a wannabe act. <laughs> <laughs> But when top billing came through, surely she, she was must like, have realized. She was like, what's this? I was like, yo, it's your boy. Yeah, because she's also from <laughs> Namibia. So these things are not immediate for her. You know? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> I mean, all of those things just, uh, I just got blessings and gifts and, and yeah. beautiful experiences with my wife. And, and, and one of them is a, it's a girl. One of them is a blue-eyed, blonde-haired girl. So yeah. now I've got other problems. You know? <laughs> now I've got to deal with people saying, yeah, Clint Brink lied to us saying he's a colored guy. Look at your blonde, blue-eyed, blue-eyed daughter. Yeah, look at the lies. <laughs> Where does this one come from? Yeah, come on now. It's amazing. And the families, the, the Namibian side of the family, how great. has that gone? Great, brother. Yeah. Great, great. Um, my my in-laws, my, my father-in-law, and my, my father, my mother-in-law, they farmers. Okay. So talking about people that wake up at Harper's four, five o'clock in the mm. morning, they mm. know hard work like no other. They yeah. support their children Jeez. like I've like I've never seen support like that, mm. really. And I was accepted. And there was also, the, I think this was a weird concept for me because now I was married to their daughter, right? And the way we had to get, I had to ask for marriage is something that people will be <laughs> mad at, bro. <laughs> How did But, you do it? My wife three said, months into the relationship. My wife said I had to call her father uh-huh. and said, ask him on the phone. I said, I can't ask your dad on the phone to get married. I'm like, I'm gonna get shot, bro. Mm. That's not how it that's not how it works. How did you want to do it? How did you see I it? Need to, I need to first sit thing, across the table. Met, yeah, sit in your living room. You need to have an experience of who I am. And this is how my parents also raised me. You know, mm. this is how things are done the proper way. Don't And? just like, hey, uncle, hey, hey. Yeah, yeah I, I like your daughter. I love your daughter. You know, so wanna... what you say, we get hitched. <laughs> Which, how yeah, about I marry How about, daughter? you know, we do this thing. <laughs> um, but uh, listen, I, I've been accepted. With did you do arms. it? Uh, which way did you choose? Man, I did it the way that my wife <laughs> said I should do it <laughs> against my better judgment. And what did, he, she, what did he, daddy say? He was not that happy. He was like, um, uh, listen, Clint, uh, hey man, this is not how we do things. I just, I can't give you an answer now. I'll speak to you tomorrow. I called my wife. I said, why Why did you say I should do it like that? She was like, but you were in Namibia. You should have just asked him. I said, that was the first time that I met him. Hey, uncle, nice to meet you. I'm the guy that you don't know from uh, mm, South, Joba, Africa. <laughs> South Africa, you know, uh, that's 11 years older than your daughter, mm. who is Miss Namibia. Can I marry her? <laughs> that's <laughs> crazy. Like that. <laughs> uh, Let's meet him. No, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And then apparently my wife said, my mother-in-law told my father-in-law and said, Steve, you know that was your daughter's idea to do it like that. You know her. <laughs> you know that she put him up to do it like this. That's it. <laughs> Speak to him tomorrow and we'll sort these things out. Yeah. Long story short, <laughs> really respectful, big-hearted, big-hearted people. And... Yeah. um. The connection between Steffi's family and my family were automatic, you know. Yeah. There comes that thing, same value system, more or less similar uh, uh, understandings mm. of, of of life and similar viewpoints. So it was really, it's just been an amazing experience. And mm. um, yeah, man, things that Steph and I have done together. We did mm. amateur bodybuilding together, amateur boxing together. We've done skydiving. Jeez. You know? Have you competed anything as a couple? Competed, yeah. yeah. We competed in bodybuilding. Yes. We competed, yeah. We competed <laughs> in the in the amateur boxing thing as well. They had a celebrity boxing thing once and she didn't want to train that hard and I was like, listen, um, this is not like running hurdles. You're going to get mm. hit in the face. <laughs> yeah, yeah, show up myself. I've got some experience in this thing, you know. I, yeah. I, I've, I can handle myself. Um, But my wife, being the type of person that she is, I'm the I'm the guy who would take my time mm. to assess things and then apply myself. She's the type of person to say, "Hey, the opportunity is here. Let's go let's now." Go. I'm like, "Hold up!" <laughs> <laughs> and 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 it's it's weird because she's a sprinter, mm. so power over short distances. Me being more of a Muay Thai okay. boxing background, more of an endurance, endurance athlete, yeah. an endurance guy. Yeah. So that's kind of like our mindset as well, and we complement each other. Wow, fantastically incredible! It's a, 
Sounds fairy tale, you know? Fairy tale, brother. Yeah. Fairy tale, brother. And um, I just feel completely and utterly grateful to have lived the lives I have lived in the 43 years that I've been alive. And I really feel like I'm only getting started on many levels, you know? Mm, mm. There's so much living still to do. There's so many things to still contribute to and help and yeah. and shape, you know? And I'm, I'm, I'm here for all of that. Your family unit, how strong is it now? Family, like my, yeah, my your, immediate family. Your, your, your side of the family, so to speak. My side of the family, we are tight. Yeah. We've, we've always been tight, just like Steph's family is really mm. tight. Yeah. Uh, you know, tight units. We're the same. Um, Who's on your side immediate? Is it, uh, you, you speak of a brother. You know, so I've got a younger sister. A younger sister, yes, you yeah, did. I've got yeah, a younger sister, a Vicky. Younger sister, yes. And then I have my, my mother, Crystalina. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then my uh, my sister, Vicky, she has a son, Christopher. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a... He's turning seven soon. Jeez, look at that. And how old is your, your daughter? My daughter is seven months. Jeez. Seven months old, yeah. yeah. Ariel Harmony Brink. How are you enjoying the fatherhood? The best. <laughs> it's it's my best ever. It's my best ever. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just... Man, uh, I think because I'm a guy that... Apply, look, I mean, I'm the guy that writes mm. songs in between me doing scenes while I'm shooting a 10, 12-hour day. Jeez. And then be able to go out of that and apply myself creatively creatively in a different capacity mm. and 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 do it justice mm. you know so i'm a guy that has many drawers open simultaneously mm. you know i i train like an athlete mm. i act like a hollywood a-lister because mm. that's kind of like the bar that i set for my, set myself i go out there and produce music like a full-blown musician mm. that's who's got published work that can stand on its own yeah. um and here I have someone that's just completely, uh, my wife just really compliments all of these things. Yeah. So my sister, my mom, myself, Christopher, and obviously we don't have my dad anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, tight-knit families. So yeah. I, I think I went off topic there. No, 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 it's okay. Because my curiosity is about, it's about, uh, your daughter and your relationship with with your daughter and fa yeah. the relationship with fatherhood, really. Yeah. You, how you you enjoy it and how you embrace it. It's man. I, I, I did I did say your father of the year already. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it really just is. Um, it's the best. Like I said, I just know not wasting anything anymore, man. I yeah. look. I know what it's like to wake up in the morning and pray that you don't see another day. Because that's how I felt about my life for a very long time. <laughs> Even though there were people who were uh, on the outside really looked at my life and said, you know what, man, I, this guy's got it made. He's got everything. Yeah. I, I want to be like that guy. Mm. And there were crucial things that I did not have in my life that I was yearning to have. Mm. And um, now being a father for a short time and then having to lose my father in this process Mm. It's something else, man. I mean, I've lost friends, I've lost colleagues, I've lost loved ones. Losing a parent is different. Losing a parent really feels like the roof has just been ripped off the house mm. and everyone is vulnerable and exposed now. Mm. And that also further highlighted to me the importance of a father in a home mm. because even just his mere presence brings comfort and safety and security. Yeah. And when, he, and when that presence is no longer there, man, it's a big hole. You feel it and you miss it and you feel exposed mm -hmm. and you feel like life is now one step closer huh. to you dealing with it all by yourself on your own, you know? And um, yeah, so many things that happened. Mm -hmm. um, my dad was the type of guy that I would, I would call him, he was like my earthing. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> I mean, he was Clinton. I'm yeah, Clint. Clint, yes. So I'm named after him. I kind of look like him. Yeah. You know, we share similarities. And he always told me, he was like, man, you fucking frustrate me because <laughs> it's like copy and paste looking oh. at you. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's like hearing me say and do all of these things that uh, I did when I was your yeah, age, man. Yeah. I can't believe it. And, um, <laughs> He made himself. Yeah, he made himself. And, he, <laughs> and that frustrated him. He was like, oh, please. He was a handful to himself. Yeah. And, um, Jeez. He would be the guy that I would call first thing in the morning on my way to work at six in the morning mm. because he was a diabetic. You yeah. Know? 
you know, his sleep patterns weren't that great uh, anymore. Mm. And um, when, it, when his health started deteriorating, he was no longer working as well, you mm. know, which was mm. frustrating for him. But what it, what it did for us is give him to us in a different capacity because yeah. when he was younger, he was out needing to work really hard and not be at home a lot, mm-hmm. trying to build structures to, to, to propel us and take us forward, you know, yeah. which he did successfully. <laughs> and um, I would call him first thing in the morning if I had good news or if I had bad news or I just needed a man's perspective and because I don't trust that easily and I don't just trust anyone's opinion, I would rather get it from someone that knows me pretty mm-hmm. well enough, you know. And um, <clears throat> not having that at my disposal at this juncture juncture in my life uh, is another learning curve and another, another experience to, to discover myself and my mm-hmm. life in a, in a different mm-hmm. capacity. I've, 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 I've gotten to the point where everything for me is a blessing in my life. The mm. hardships and the trials because I, I've seen firsthand that there are blessings in your hardships. Yeah. There's, there's treasures that await you if you're able to persevere and if you're able to see it through. And even when the night is at its darkest, a small candle mm. is enough light to dispel that darkness and then you just build on that, you know. So um, being a father, I feel is a massive privilege. Mm. Uh, it's a responsibility. I, it's not even a duty. It's just something that I've got the deep love for. And, and knowing now how easily life can, can leave us, you know, in the blink of an eye, yeah. I, I drink all of it with my eyes open you know, and I just savor <laughs> the taste. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel daddy left uh, a strong enough foundation for fatherhood? Definitely. Yeah. My dad told me to what the, the, the tail end of his life, because um, when I was a teenager, I didn't necessarily feel like we had a great rapport. Okay. I was always at loggerheads with my dad. Mm. Um, and I felt like a mm, stubborn guy. <laughs> he probably <laughs> felt the same about you. He probably felt the same about <laughs> me. This guy doesn't want to listen to anyone when he wants to do his yeah. own thing all the time. He doesn't yeah. see me, doesn't understand me. Um, not knowing that he did his best to deal with his hardships and he didn't have a dad he could be open and honest with to help mm. him transition through those things. Yeah. You know, and I only discovered that later on in my life that my dad told me he's like the the only physical contact that he ever had with his dad when is when he took his father on a plane trip to uh, uh, to England mm. because my grandfather... Um, loved growing flowers okay. and contests. So my the house that I grew up in, in Wellington, was surrounded by trees and flowers and stuff. Like I grew up in, in, in paradise because mm. that's what my grandfather, you know, that was his passion. Mm. So he said the only time he had physical contact with his dad is when the arms were touching on the, the, plane. On the armrest on the plane for 14 hours. And he said that was the first time that his dad never had a drink. But because he was a little bit nervous about flying, he bought him a whiskey. And he said that's the first time that he had a drink with his dad. Mm. His dad passed away, never heard him say, I love you, I'm proud of you, like yeah. old cowboys did. He took care, care of his father after he had a stroke, you know, and had to attend to him. And I, uh, that really gave me some context into who my father was. My father always told me that he loved me and mm. that he was proud of me. Mm. That was already an upgrade from his situation. Like huge upgrade. Massive upgrade, you know? Yeah. And you don't understand these va- the value of these things when it's an ordinary thing in your life. And then the older you get, you start seeing, but hey, not everyone has a dad in the house. Not everyone knows what it is to have that male leadership and that example. And mm. that, that is the reason why we as a country, you know, I mean, it's been said about Africa. Mm. We are a country of many leaders, but few fathers. True. You know? Yeah. And this is where I feel like I'm privileged and I've been gifted the opportunity to see more years so that maybe not even through my craft and through my artistry and, mm. and, and what I'm, what I'm, my gifting, 
But through my love and care for my family, I'm able to contribute in a different capacity. Yeah. And I mean, everyone's talking, everyone's out there building legacy and wanting to build these big buildings and, you know, accumulate millions and billions of rands and stuff like that, thinking that's their legacy. Your legacy will be your children. Yeah. Because your, your children will walk through the doors of tomorrow that we can't enter. Mm. They will have conversations and they will influence people that we will never meet. They are our legacy. The question is, how much have you left with them? How much have you left with yeah. them? At my dad's funeral, I didn't know what to write. I didn't know what to say. I saw him pass away right in front of me. I, I was blessed enough mm. to be with him in his last moments. Wow. And just like he was a fighter in his life, he was a fighter in death, proud, mm. quiet. And he chose to not go to hospital. He was like, if worst comes to worst, you will be there with me. And mm. it was exactly that, you know. And uh, when I had to talk at his funeral, I just said, hey, man, when your dad goes, that's a big blow because he's the invincible guy. Mm -hmm. You know, he, that's not the person you see going. That's the person you see enduring and persevering for a very long time. Yeah. I said, but, if ever I miss him, I don't have to look far, really. I look in the mirror and I see a piece of him. Mm. All my successes and my victories and my overcomings, it's got his signature on it because he showed me how to do it. I saw him do it in his life. Yes. So therefore I could do it. I saw him love his family. I saw him go out and sacrifice for his family. I know now how to do that and to do it even better because he always told me, you need to be better than what I am. Mm -hmm. mm. So, do you think you've plus, lived up to that? Yeah, I think he's really happy. I mean, he told me, <laughs> he's, he's really proud. He's yeah. really, really happy. And plus, you know, my dad had blue eyes. So I told him, I said, hey, chief, you're lucky me I didn't get those blue eyes. There would have mm. been a problem in South Africa. <laughs> Damn! <laughs> <laughs> Imagine I still had that in my arsenal. You're lucky I didn't stay on your block being my... Yes. Well, the blue eyes are with your daughter. And I told him, I said, you're going to leave me something, man. Leave me something to remember you by. Yeah. And every time I look at my daughter, I still see, I still see a lot of my dad. So I feel privileged, you know. He, mm. he could hold her on, on day one. Mm, that happened. He could hold her on day one. Yeah. And uh, when she was born... My, my parents were with me for about 18 days. Wow. And that was, I think he saved the last of his life energy to see that materialize in my life so that I'm fine before he left. Mm. You know? And, Incredible. Uh, yeah, man. Incredible. Yeah. What do you still dream of? What, what still lies ahead for you, for you in terms of your dreams? Um, I'm still that kid that sees myself... Uh, being on really big productions. Mm. I feel like I still have lots of potential and lots of capacity to still learn a lot and to still give a lot. So in mm. whatever capacity I can do that, whether it's through acting, whether it's through music, whether it's through mentorship, whether yeah. it's through showing what vulnerability, the strength of vulnerability, whether it's in my relationship dynamics, mm. you know, Everything that I want to do, I still want to take it to the next level all the time. Yeah. Am I content with my life? Definitely. But at the same time, I'm someone who strives to do more and to be more because I have the capacity to do so. To so do therefore, it. I would always want more. Yeah. Do you know, one of the reasons why I called, I called for you to come here is because I love the work you've done over the years and that you've remained consistent. I'm aware of that. I needed to hear it from you. You've remained consistent uh, on TV, but your passion for music continues to shine through. You don't switch that little light off ever. No. <laughs> and I don't think you'll ever switch it off. Uh, as long as uh, you are still you're able to, to sing, you'll continue to sing. But there's a moment where you couldn't sing. Yes. Yeah. COVID. Yeah. COVID was a horrible, horrible time for yeah. you. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no. Hey, um, I mean, it destroyed it, it destroyed our economy, already fragile economy. You yeah. Know? Uh, and there were so many things attached to COVID that we don't hear about or see ever since it's kind of like just disappeared all of a sudden. Mm. 
Mm. Um, <laughs> like it never happened. Like it never happened, you yeah. know. But I think the thing that I think they spent a lot of time, money, and attention on the prevention of COVID that they didn't put systems in place for the recovery of COVID. Which is a different world altogether and you're part of that. Man, I know people that have gone in, you know, I've got family members who are trauma nurses. I, 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 they work in the ICU, they work with people all the time, right? They've told me of cases of people coming into the hospital having COVID. Mm. Falling ill, obviously, needed to be treated in hospital. After their treatment's done, they are either blind. Some people ended up in a wheelchair. Some people have lost their hearing. Some people have health. Some people's health have deteriorated on, mm. on, on a massive scale. You know, it's never the same. You're never the same. I mean, the fact that you lose your taste and your smell is a brain thing. It's a neuro thing, mm. you know? and um, that's why a lot of people struggle with it. I mean, still now, way years after I've had it, my smell and my taste is not the same. And let me tell you. That really makes life different for you because if your senses are dull, you feel like your experience of life is dull. Mm, that's true. It's not what it used to be. Yeah. I remember things tasting nicely. I remember when a smell could really attach to a memory and being vivid. Now it's 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 not like that anymore. Mm, mm. And I think the thing that was the worst for me is that, like I said, you know, I I got psoriasis after I had COVID uh, in my nose, my ear canal. It uh, gave me severe post-nasal drip. I had to see autoimmune coaches. Sheesh. I've spoken to gut health therapists. Um, I've I've had to see the ENT for years. Mm. You know, every every four weeks needing to go do a scrape and clear everything out so I can actually hear and what? I can actually do my job. And I had no voice. I had no voice. I thought that this was the end of of my music career. Yeah. Of my what I felt like wasn't really like a, a super successful music career, but, but a music but, career nonetheless, yes. you know. And that brings you joy. That brings me joy. And this is what changed for me musically now is mm. that I have been able to connect with the medicinal properties of music, with the healing properties wow. of music yeah. rather than just musicianship. Yes, you know, and it carries on. It continues now. Man, even if I'm not at my best, my intention behind why I create can still offer healing. Yeah. And just because I'm hurt and just because I'm injured, like I told you before, it's not enough reason for me to just quit on myself. How did you learn to dreams. play a piano? My next door neighbor. Mm. Yeah. Leroy <laughs> Kroenberg. Leroy Kroenberg. Back home, pa. Back home, back home, pa. You know, yeah. he left, he he was one of the first people I saw drop out of school be, to become a musician. Drop Whoa. out of high school. <laughs> and you're like, why would you do that? Your parents won't allow you. He was like, Psh, man, I don't care what my parents say. This is what I wanted to do. And, yeah. you know, driven, incredibly talented. And, you know, growing up in the Western Cape, when it comes to live music, you're never short of that. Mm -hmm. Still today, I have to be honest. I don't know how Joburg people will feel with feel about what I have to say is, but I feel like Joburg, especially if you're a Cape Tonian mm. and coming from that background where you are seen as credible if your skill has some form of merit. Mm. In Joburg, I had to realize, yo, if you don't have the gift of the gab, if you don't know how to use your <laughs> mouth and you don't know how to position yourself properly, your talent will mean nothing. Yeah, so your talent is, doesn't come first. <laughs> your talent doesn't come yeah, first. You're no. not the guy we call to come and play no, the guitar. No, bro. <laughs> yo, and, yeah. and, 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 you know, hustlers will, you know. The hustlers will hustlers, get the gig. Hustlers will get the gig. And that also just added on to my arsenal. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the music thing will never, ever stop Amazing. for me. I, Leroy taught me. I took things a little bit further and just mm. spent a lot of, you know, I think a lot of music has to do with, especially if you're self-taught, um, it's just man hours, spending time. Just do it all on your own, just do it over and over again. Time. I mean, that's why John Mayer did it. You know, you can yeah. hear there's a guy that just, this was a guy that spent hours by himself playing, playing and becoming himself. Yeah. Not becoming like anyone else, becoming himself. That's true. Yeah. John Mayer. I think that's, I think that's the ultimate work in life mm. is to become who you were always supposed to be. That is what we are supposed to do in life. I think you're you're a special South African actor, special South African musician. We haven't had, uh, we haven't had enough of you. We haven't seen all of you, and and I wish you a million more years of what you're doing. 
And may your family grow and become the it family. How's that? <laughs> I don't care for those titles though. <laughs> yeah, I'm may, with you there. May, may it grow. May, may you continue to be, you know, the light in, in all of these moments. Because what you're doing with your daughter that continues to show on social media in its tiny, small little way, it's showing fatherhood. It, it's demonstrating. It's like an advert <laughs> for fatherhood. And may you continue to do it. And I know... There'll always be naysayers. That's just how South Africa is. If there's yeah. nothing, I the saw it. Yeah, the world will always be like that. I saw uh, when we were celebrating uh, the uh, the Boke winning. I remember I tweeted something. I said, "I wonder when. What is the one thing we're going to complain about with this?" <laughs> and we found one. Yeah, we found uh, what's this? said uh, uh, where people said, "But it's not coming to us. Why is it yes. not coming to us?" Yes. You know, we we also want to find want to see it in Limpopo. Mm. So we always do find something to complain about in. Anything, but I say to you, you're a special South African, and and here on this platform, for me, it's about celebrating South Africans that I just watch and say, "Wow, man, he's so cool. I want to hang out with him and hear his life story and hear his wisdom and his observations of life." So thank you very much, Clint. Thank you, David. Thank you, man. Yeah. Hey, I have to say, just in 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 closing, I, I am really grateful for every opportunity and to connect with people like you, like minded people. Thank you, man. You know. I'm 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 getting a lot of your wisdom and yeah. learning a lot from your compassion and your intention yeah. behind what you're doing. And um I think the thing that I about fatherhood that for me is is something that I cherish. Mm. For me it's a bigger responsibility than being a TV dude. Mm. <laughs> for me it's 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 the biggest it's the biggest privilege and the biggest responsibility and the biggest honor. Yeah. And um Life doesn't come easily, man. You know, uh, we also think that, you know, you're with someone and wham, bam, there you go, you have a kid. It's not like that. Mm. You know, some people take time. Some people spend lifetimes together and never have that privilege. And here I am against the odds um, with the Miss Namibia that I met over Instagram. <laughs> that's 11 years younger than me. Who married me shot. when I only had 900 bucks in my pocket. Hey. We are living a beautiful, healthy, yeah. wholesome, and and blessed life, man. So, <laughs> yeah, all, all, all praise to to God for mm. for this awesome design of life. Yeah, and um, I'm I wouldn't go back and rewrite anything that I've been through. I, I, I even, see the, even the worst of moments, even eh? the worst of moments, yeah. have contributed to to great value in my life, my brother. You're the man. Oh, yeah. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. I say every day now, I should say it, like and subscribe. <laughs> if you come this far, you might as well. Yeah, Thank you, you very much. Yeah, you better. <laughs> Thank you very much, Clint. Thank it's you, been brother. great. Thank you, David. There oh, you go. Yeah. It's Clint, Clint Prince, everybody. King, King David Studio Podcast.